All right, those of you that struggle with eating too much, I'm gonna issue you a challenge right now. I dare you, eat your body weight in grams of protein from Whole Foods, prioritize it in every meal, meaning eat your protein first, and watch what happens. I bet you 99% of you will lose weight. It's hard to overeat when you hit your protein targets. This is a fact. So instead of trying to cut things out, just hit those protein targets and then watch what happens. This is uh, my favorite thing to say. Yeah, it took me at, at least, I don't know, seven, eight years before I figured this piece out with my clients instead of overcomplicating it by writing out all these ridiculously... Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, uh, diet plans that had you know half of an orange and four crackers yeah. of this and two scoops of tuna, <laughs> quarter, like, quarter, quarter tablespoon of uh, yeah, peanut yeah, butter. Trying to figure out exactly the perfect macros for each client. I was just like, you know what? Just this is what I want you to do: whole foods and count your protein intake. Just do that. I promise, if we do that, and I'm not worried about anything else. I swear, it would work every time. Dude, my brother, my brother-in-law, right now, he's uh, he's trying to get leaner. And uh, I've been talking to him about this forever. And, and he finally is like, dude, I started tracking my protein just to see what I'm hitting. Mm -hmm. He's like, I'm hitting like, like 50 or 60 grams a day. I said, bro, just try. He weighs, I think, 180 pounds. He said, hit 180 grams of protein from Whole Foods. He's like, but I'm just going to eat more. That's just going to make me fatter. I'm trying to get lean. I said, just do it. Watch what yeah. happens. Sure enough, four days later, he's like, I can't. He goes, I can't eat that much. It's like, it's stuffing me. Yeah. I said, and, and what's happening? Are you starting to lose weight? He's like, well, I'll let you know. And sure enough, you know, two weeks later, he's been doing it. Your brother's not 180. My brother-in-law. Oh, yeah. I was like, bro, your brother's <laughs> like, like my brother's 240. Giant. Yeah, he's like, a big boy. Yeah, he's yeah. a big boy. No, no, my brother -in -law. Oh, I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, when do you get down to 180? Yeah, no, no, no. Your brother -in -law. My brother's leg is 180. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's a, he got all the genetics, didn't he? Oh, dude. Oh, I, dude, I'm still shook from the, the story you were telling about your brother that, that happened to him. This the Was it yesterday that happened to him with yeah. the, when he was with the baby? Like, Yeah, some dude. Some that brought it back for me, I forgot about that. I don't know if I ever shared that on the podcast or not, but that was like a moment as a dad where I was like, oh, that did not feel good. Yeah, I mean, long story short, he's just a, some drunk guy threw a, like a full beer can at him and his kid, just randomly while he was with his kid. Were they walking in their neighborhood? Is they were just walking around. Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, he was like walking kind of through downtown or whatever where he's at. And um, he said it was a weird feeling. He goes, because you have your kid. So his son's not even two years old or two years old, right? He's like, I had to get away because you want to protect your kid. Mm -hmm. And then when he f realized his kid was safe, then the rage comes up. I've had that, you know, where you feel like your kid's uh, you know, at risk mm -hmm. um, and you just want to get your kids safe. And then when you realize they're safe, then they're like, now oh, it's, yeah, it's animal. Like the gloves are off. Yeah. yeah. Dude, that's what happened to you, right? You were walking with. Yeah, we were. I was pushing Matt. This was when Max was, he was under, he was for sure under two i think it was under a year because that was actually a, yeah he was under, i think you had you were carrying him in fact no i think i was pushing him in the stroller okay i was pushing him in the stroller he's under one we we used to katrina and i used to do this like loop about a mi half mile loop around our neighborhood um a real actually real peaceful nice neighborhood this is back when we live off of bernetti over there and um and this dude he was he was walking towards me and i could i could see him a ways away and you could just tell he was drunk i mean he was staggering and he was kind of yelling and talking and it's like me and him and we're walking straight towards each other and i just had this moment of like oh shit what do i do if he tries to attack me or makes a move towards me and i thought you know you think initially like oh i'll, f I'll fight him i'll do whatever i'll protect no, but then you, you go like kid at risk yeah but then my kid's at risk right like, what if he had a knife and what if it doesn't go well and like so then you go shit then that's even worse right so then i have this angry guy who we get into it and then now my son is so yeah, I had that. And I, I remember I kind of bolted across the street, but the, I'll, I'll never forget that moment of being faced with that. Like, oh shit, what would I do in a situation like that? It's and, a weird conundrum mm -hmm. because you want to like, you want to be aggressive, but then you, but then you're like, this can put my kid at risk. So then you want to run or what do I do? It's a weird feeling. Yeah. yeah. Although I would before. bet all of my money on, on the dad in that situation. I don't care how big you are as a dad. Like well, that's, uh, yeah. dude, I know my brother and my brother is, he's a big, like I tell I say he's got all the genetics because he does. This kid, I say kid, he's a grown man now. He's a kid, he's my younger brother. He don't even work out. He'll put up 315 <laughs> on the bench, like just whatever. Yeah. Like he's just a strong dude. He got my dad's genes, right, with the strength. 
And I mean that whoever that guy was is oh. is actually quite fortunate because I know him. Yeah. And he would have got hurt. There'd be a lot more purpose hurt. behind each one oh. of those strikes. Yeah, Let's imagine if, that if uh, his wife was with him because then you hand the baby to wife, tell her to go, and then you go handle. Oh, business. someone throws a full can. Yeah, at your yeah. kid. Here, take our son. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna go hold ahead. him and run because yeah. I'm about to go kill someone. Yeah. yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Crazy. What's up, everybody? By the way, we have another channel. It's Mind Pump Clips. These are your favorite clips of our episodes. Really smart cool things that we said, short clips, mind pump clips. Anyway, I'm going to give away a free program today. Maps Aesthetic, that's the giveaway. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you do all those things and you win, we'll let you know in the comment section that you got free access to Maps Aesthetic. We also have a sale going on right now on some workout programs and workout program bundles. Check this out. Maps Cardio, 50% off. The Shredded Summer Bundle of Programs is 50% off. And the Bikini Bundle of Programs is also 50% off. If you're interested in any of those, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. But anyway, my, so, you know, back to what I was saying. So my brother-in-law is doing this and he's like, I didn't realize, like, obviously you tell somebody something and they have to experience it themselves. Yeah. He's like, dude, he goes, it literally, he goes, I feel like I'm stuffing myself. Yeah. And I'm, I'm getting leaner and I'm losing weight. And of course, he's getting the benefit of the strength and the recovery and the muscle because he went from 60 grams to, you know, now he's hitting like 150, 160 because mm -hmm. 180 is kind of hard for him to hit. And he goes, I'm getting leaner. He goes, this is like the easiest, you know, and I'm like, yeah, I wish somebody would have told you. <laughs> I know, right? I feel like we've been bringing it up quite a bit on the show, but yeah, there's still like, you have to try it. You have to actually like go through and, and really Dude. actively pursue it each day. Cause like, it's just not going to randomly happen. That's the thing about protein. Like it's, you're not just going to like accidentally, easily, accidentally find like your body weight. No, and, do, and, and here's a big like key. This is what I had to tell him is don't get behind the eight ball. Yeah. Start your early. day off with 50 grams of protein. Mm. Otherwise, good luck. What are you going to do? Eat hundred grams uh, for lunch. That's not going to, that's not going to happen. Start in the morning so he's like, well, what is that, like three eggs? I'm like, bro, dude, do the math. Like, <laughs> yeah. like, that's like 10 eggs. It's like, you know? like Starbucks math. Yeah, you know? like, I can't eat all that. So I, I gave him uh, a few boxes of the magic spoon on the back. I said, all right, do oh, this yeah. with Whole Foods or do a mix. You can eat a bowl of that, no problem. <laughs> yeah. So I said, do a mix, right? So he's doing uh, like an omelet plus a bowl of magic spoon, oh, boom, 50 go. grams of protein. Oh, yeah. And he's like, dude, he goes, it kills my appetite for the You know, the, the other part about that strategy that I love so much is the psychological game too that you kind of play, right? Is like, I when I'm targeting protein and, you know, especially when you're first starting back on your diet and you're back on things, you, you're you going to have the cravings or the whatever the bad habits <clears throat> you might have had nutritionally. And instead of telling myself I can't have it, I just go, okay, if, if I still want it after I hit my protein, I'll have it. Yes. And what ends up happening is I get full. And so it, there's that, there is that like, uh, you're not telling yourself you can't. And so you don't have that rebellious side of like, oh, you, where you have the tendency, like a lot of people do to like restrict, 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 and then they fuck up and then they binge and they overdo it. I just go like, okay, yeah, if I really want that ice cream, I'll have it tonight. But first I got to make sure I hit my 200 grams of protein. And then if I still want it after that, then I'll enjoy See, it. And then, you, you figured this out because you've been doing this for so long. If you work with your behaviors, then you're going to succeed. Yeah. If you work against you're your behavior, to it so much easier. You're screwed. Uh, you can do all the numbers you want. You can write everything down. If it's against your nature, you're going to be white knuckling it, and eventually you're going to screw yourself over. So, like what you're saying is, it's the difference between restricting and adding, and and, and both of them result in lower calories. Okay, but one of them does not feel hard. The other one feels like you said, like you need to rebel. Yeah, and and a lot of times we'll have one. One thing will happen where you don't even want it because you're so full or you still kind of have a craving for it and you want it. But because you filled up on the protein, the serving size isn't crazy. Yes. Versus here I am. It's six o'clock at night. I'm behind on protein. I have a little low calories. Maybe I had a dinner, maybe a half hour before or whatever like that. And I'm like, oh, man, a bowl of ice cream sounds so good right now. And I have and I'm low on protein. I'll go crush a half a pint or a pint of ice cream. Yeah because I'm so hungry still versus if I go, Oh, you know what? If I just go get my protein intake, I hit that. 
then that fills me up so much that even if I am craving the ice cream or want a treat like that, I don't binge it. I have like, oh, I can have a little bit. Yeah, go bit eat 40 grams of protein, <laughs> steak or eggs or chicken, and then go see if you still want that yeah. snack. Yeah. It, it does, you don't. Well, I'm in an interesting kind of conundrum right now because uh, I knew this day was going to come, but like my both boys are actually um, starting to crave protein a lot more. And so there's like little bits of like fight over like the biggest piece of meat and all that. And I'm having to uh, establish, you know, the well, dad gets the that. dad. Yeah. yeah, dude, that's that's the dad meat right there. And it, this and, is such a, a a dad with two sons yeah. conundrum. Like, yeah. that's not a normal thing. I don't think that Sal's experienced no. that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's I mean, it, it's really just beginning. But I know that this is going to accelerate. <laughs> and it, it, of course, it. it you know, I also feel like, oh, wow, yes. Like, you know, they're, they're pursuing, um, you know, more protein. They're, they're actively trying to start lifting weights and, and, and be more physically active and, and all these things. But uh, I'm also like, mm, like, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to like, make sure I get to it first. I'm like, <laughs> uh, like, I'm like <laughs> first thing, like eyeballing it ahead of time just to make sure. Cause like, especially Ethan now, cause he gets really hungry and he also comes back and he wants like second dinners. And I'm like, dude, pfft. This is crazy, dude. This kid's on like a growth spurt right now. I'm pretty convinced. Do you guys go through milk like crazy? Yeah. 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 We do like, we do like, I, I could say we do like two gallons a week because between me and, and, uh, you know, the boys, it's, it's pretty they, much. They came in Will you drink just a glass of milk by itself? I could. Yeah. I don't typically do that anymore. Cause that'll, uh, like I'm, I'm starting to have like a threshold with that. And, yeah. and it's mainly cause like I'll do it in the morning and with the coffee and everything. And then yeah. I have to kind of. But I used to be able to just put, I would do that. It was kind of a Midwestern thing. I would do like a glass of milk with like each meal. Um, Easy way to throw calories. Like that. that's a bulk trick right it's, there. Yeah. That's why I've always been so thick. Yeah. You know, I did that. <laughs> that's not why. I did. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's, uh, there was a period there where I did a bulk. It was actually one of the more successful. And I mean, success as determined by weight gain. Not in terms of health or anything like that. Because that's why I think I can't have dairy anymore. There was a period there. I think it was, I want to say, sophomore to junior year, like a summer. Uh, and then I led the school year with this. And then eventually I couldn't do it anymore. Where I would start every morning off and I would have a quart of whole milk with breakfast. So a whole quart. So I'd buy like the, not the gallon, but the kind of senior ones. Mm -hmm. And I would just pound that uh, oh with breakfast. And I put on... <laughs> Like 13 pounds yeah. over the summer. The same. Oh, yeah. I bought in full 100% with the whole milk advertising and like it was going to like build this, you know, muscular body and like good for your bones and all that. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's just drinking gallons. Yeah. Maybe one of the most famous taglines, right? Milk does a body good. Yeah. Does a body good. Can Smart. you think of, yeah, can you think of other marketing with food like that that's done that good of a job? Uh, the other white meat <laughs> for pork. Oh, I don't know if I, uh, that one's didn't stick to me. That's mm. funny because they globbed on to bullshit science that said that white meat was healthier than red meat. <laughs> part so of a balanced breakfast. Wait a minute, breakfast. we're white. That was mine. Yeah. yeah. What was it? Oh, the part of a balanced breakfast. You could just throw any cereal in front of that. Oh, right? dude. Yeah. Do you, cereal commercials. I've said this before. In the, When we were kids, maybe they still do this. They would, at the end of the commercial, they'd say part of a balanced breakfast. And then they would have this breakfast spread that included <laughs> yeah, like toast, fruit, and like fruit and orange like. juice, <laughs> yeah. cereal. And like a pancake or something. Yeah. It was like uh, it was like all carbs. All carbs. Shit. Yeah, diabetes yeah. is what it should. No, we're dude, we're starting to date ourselves right now. Yesterday, I just this just made me think of something that was funny, of like somewhat embarrassing, right? You remember uh, um, Shannon who used to do uh, design for us, also as a model for some of our programs. I don't know if you've seen her right now. She's like shredded. She just posted a picture of that, and I did. Damn, Gina. And she's like, who's Gina? Oh. Like that. And I'm like, fuck, I forgot. Martin, Martin? Martin Lawrence. Martin Lawrence. Yeah, Martin Lawrence is like 90s. I'm oh like, my God. I don't think she's old enough to know that, but she was like so confused Dude. by that. I was like, oh my God. Did so I bad. bring that up? What's that movie with Tim Robbins and, and Martin? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love uh, that. It's like the most hilarious Where you're movie. He's stepping out the fire. Yeah. Or the he's stepping out the fire and they play that that song uh, where he's just like dancing yeah. to the whole thing, like yeah. trying to. Skitty, bop, bop, bop. Yeah, the scat man. That's yeah. it. I mean, does that My go back to the nine? That's pretty old. That's a pretty that's old. That's got to be nice. I mean, M Martin is like even further back, right? Nothing that's, to lose. Nothing 1997. to lose. Yeah. 1997. 1997. Wow. That was a, oh, yeah. I, Martin is the, I, I don't even know how old Shannon is, but she's probably not even old enough to have been alive when Martin was going, maybe. She's probably- Wait, how uh, many years ago was 1997? Can someone do the math for me real quick? What is that? 25, 30? What is that? Yeah. 26 years. 26 Hold on a second. Years. Wait, it's 2023 right now. Yeah, she's okay. not even old enough to Hold on a second. The year 20, 2049 
is as far as 1997. How's that? How fucked up does that sound? What? Say that. Oh, you're saying how far away it is? The year 2049 yeah. is as to far from it. us as the year 1997 yeah. is. Yeah. Now, how do you feel? Horrible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Considering <laughs> that I'm having a birthday here in another week. <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah, your your birthday is coming up right now, huh? Yeah. How old are you going to be? 72? Uh, huh? <laughs> 71. Don't, don't make me. No, I'm going to be 58. Oh, 58, shit. Bro, bro. Okay. Hold on we a second. need to make sure we do a big 60, dude. Big yeah. 60. What do you want to do for your 60? I want to go someplace. Of course. Like, what do you want? To, I yeah. mean, like, how Antarctica. crazy do you want to get? Let's do something well, crazy. I yeah. don't know. Let's yeah. Let's go to Europe or something. That sounds super. That crazy. doesn't sound crazy. <laughs> no, come on. I love Europe. Yeah. So what? We gotta do something crazy. <laughs> okay, crazy. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let me, yeah, let me you know, think like about a, this. Like a boys trip. Hey, you know what we should do? No Dive family, with great no white kids, shark. No wives and kids. How long? No boys trip for the sixties. You know what we should do? He'll forget my shoot pigs out of a helicopter. Shark tank. This is what we should do. We should hire like people actors. To kidnap, like he won't even know, right? Yes. To kidnap him, like the game. Yeah, and like yeah. hold him hostage. Yeah, you might, see how good he my heart is. Now. And he then we and, and, tie him up, then throw him out. Hey, like we all hunt and him. And then we come and save him. Have you guys yeah, ever? Exactly. Hey, you, so my my girlfriend. Went, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I like you this idea. Save me. My my girlfriend that we were talking about when this this pod, before this podcast started that Justin we were sharing the old bar fight story. Yeah. Um, her brother was in his teen when he was <clears throat> a teen was like really rebellious and his parents hired one of those companies oh to take them to like that the they, they kidnap him in the middle of the night they literally you did throw that. him in a van and yes, everything yes they, they have companies that do that yes, yeah they do wow. yes and they take them they take them for That's i can't intense. now they don't they don't like kidnap you kidnap you yeah, they, they don't like throw like a just, hood over your head they show up in the middle of the night they yeah. say get a backpack full that's about yeah. as much as you can bring yeah. what you're going with us and then you're required to go with them Wow. And they take you to like some wilderness thing or whatever. Oh, that's I know a kid that did that and it worked. It worked yeah. on this kid. It's like scared straight or whatever. <laughs> yeah, he's yeah. like a he's a he's a lineman now for PG and E and super successful and good dude. But he went through a really rebellious phase and they they I remember when they had me come like he was let's see here she's like a good four years younger than me he's probably so he's good like eight to ten years younger than me. And so I'm like in my mid twenties and I remember like he looked up to me. And so the parent, they asked me, I was only dating her at that point for maybe a year or less. And they were like, like can you him? talk to him? Yeah. So like, and I, in I sat him, I remember sitting down in the room with him and trying to talk some did sense. Did you know and, it was a waste of time? Yeah, I did. Like, I remember being like this, I mean, who am I? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, the kid, maybe he kind of looks up to me or whatever that, but he ain't respect me on that kind of level. Where <clears> no, you know how it's turn his life around. Cause I go in there. So <laughs> this is how it worked for my, so I had yeah. clients who did that with their kid. And the reason why it worked was cause I'm like, how, how's this? Like, I feel like it would make a kid go the opposite direction. Like what? No, what they did is they took him and they put him in a leadership position with other kids. And he was responsible for other kids. He was responsible yeah, for- That makes sense. So they developed like responsibility and confidence. Mm -hmm. And that's how he came back. He came mm -hmm. back with a new, you know, new they, they, yeah, found he needed skills. some purpose, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. Crazy. Yeah, he uh, did the same thing. I don't, extreme, I don't remember man. all the details of what the camp did, but I know it was like kind of one of those survival ones that give you like very minimal stuff and you got to figure shit out. Like, and he, I can't remember if it was- Weeks or a month? Do you know how long they take them? I don't remember how long they take oh, them. Oh, I, I think this kid went for like a couple months. I think so too. I it's can't. Expensive. It is. I remember it was really expensive yeah. to get done. I remember you got to pay money for that. Yeah, it was over ten thousand yeah. dollars. I don't remember exactly how much it was, but I know it was north. Well, of now 10, I can 000. threaten that to my boy. That's good to know. <laughs> just keep, 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 Somebody might just take you. My parents. Way. I don't see. I don't see your boys rebelling too much with you. Yeah, you never know, know. But you're right. You never know. Good kids. You never know. We'll really, see. I feel like you would smell it by now. I feel like you can kind of sense that early by mm, now. You mm. don't think so, or do you? I mean, I don't. I don't have any. He doesn't want to tempt that, the freaking rebel, yeah, rebellion like, gods. Yeah, I don't want to roll the dice. Well, and that, I, I definitely don't see it impossible even if it is any. It'll be ever. It'll be the mini you. Yeah, the mini yeah. you will be the. I, we talk a lot of, around that, like a, you know, like it. I think really it's just acknowledging like what sucks, you know? And like, we talk through that a lot, especially with school. Like, you know, like I didn't like it. Like I didn't like, it felt like prison to me, you know? And so I understand, like I can empathize with him with, with some of that stuff. Yeah. And it's really just like forcing him to do anything. It's just the, the, the force part of it. He is so uh, uh, opposing to that. Like it's an immediate, like, no, you know, it's just, he wants to establish that. Like, Dude. look, I'll, I'll figure this out. Bro, school is so unnatural. It's so unnatural. It's such a weird, artificial yeah. learning environment that no wonder there's such a huge percentage of kids that have to be medicated or just don't, or just feel like they're not smart. It's like, it's such a, I love learning. You guys, well, all of us do. We're all love learning. We're all very curious. All of us had bad experiences. 
because it was such a it's just it's not a great environment. There's a, yeah. there's a certain type of kid it works for. Yeah, everybody else it sucks. Yeah, you know, get yeah, me out of here. It wasn't for me. Yeah. Did Peterson talk about that in his talk? By the way, how did you guys enjoy the Ramsey? That was oh, wow. yeah, ultra, ultra surprisingly, leadership. yeah. And I'm not I'm not one for like the rally uh, summits and business, but it was it was great. Great speakers. He has got built a lot him, out of it. He's built himself. A, you know, you could tell a lot about uh, a leader by the people that work under him, like several layers. Mm -hmm. And you meet some of these people that these like coaches and people who work in the event, and they're just just they're good people. Yeah. They're just I mean, that's really, why really good culture. People. So yeah. I, you know, my buddy, Chris, who's been on the show and stuff like that is not a fan of Ramsey. He's always like poking at him and stuff like that. And I just, and I know he's got like a lawsuit that's out right now. There's like a $150 million lawsuit on Ramsey right now. That's out like well, right now. Dude, he's been doing this for how many years? Well, You're this is what, lawsuits this what I, I mean, one of the things I've learned since we've done this now, I've been wrong more times than I've been right about somebody's character, yeah. mm -hmm. especially the bigger and more famous. And that goes both ways too, by the way, there's people yeah. who I get excited to meet. Cause I'm like, Oh, they're going to be so amazing. And I meet them in their douchebags. Yeah. And then there's people who you hear all this negative stuff about them. They're like, Oh, I bet they're a piece of shit. And they're this, and that. And then you meet them. They're like, Oh my, god they're amazing so you know i am I'm, I'm really i haven't i haven't spent enough time with ramsey personal enough to like have my own judgment of who he is as an individual but from what i perceive of the being around an event like that and seeing people that he's impacting real hard for me to cast a lot of negative judgment on somebody that's beloved by that many people for and and like it reminds me like on a grander scale to the when we have the events for our people when we have mm -hmm. people come it always humbles me of like wow how what good we're doing out there with helping people mm -hmm. that's how i felt when i was at his event i felt like these people were just and the people who work for yeah, him genuinely this? were helped you yeah it was uh from listeners it, it's a it's a listeners who say they were defrauded by a timeshare exit company that he promoted Hmm. Yeah, so, so he okay. so he promoted this come over the course of uh, five years. I think he made like thirty million or something like that. I think or six years, thirty million over six years over advertising this thing, and then you know, I, obviously, it probably went under, didn't do well. But look, how long has this guy been on radio? Thirty years. Thirty years. He's he's been talking about stuff forever. You're, you're, you know. I mean, not only that, and the, the thing that the point that I was making with my buddy Chris is just like, you know, thirty million sounds like a lot of money when you think of Ramsey as an individual, but he didn't put thirty million in his pocket. Right. Well, the guy has a thousand employees. Now divide that number by a thousand now, yeah. and then okay, so the, his business represented this company. It ended up. You know, wh whatever, and I'm not defending because I don't know enough about this. It's also subject. facing a lawsuit. We don't know what the. I don't. I don't think there's any results of it. Yeah, no, it's it's real similar to all the stuff I see. I see a bunch of stuff going on. Well, with uh, look, I, I had an incredible experience. The people, the environment, uh, the energy in there was so like everything about it was like, don't worry about other people. What can you do about yourself? Turn off negative information. Uh, it was about building businesses through working with your employees and building their working with their character mm -hmm. and developing good character yourself. There was a lot of like pro family, pro like spend time with your loved ones talk. It wasn't like those places that you you know this is how you make money. Uh, you know just you know put your head in the sand and grind. You know forget everybody else. This was a very balanced, uh, great message yeah. that they that except they for for one speaker. And I have to say this because I was wrong, right? I, I definitely, I, I kind of chirped at Sal because we're like, I don't know, we're about 10 minutes into a Malcolm Gladwell talk. Yeah, yeah. And Sal right away gets like turned off. Oh, that fucking Marxist socialist idea. So he <laughs> kind of grumbles something like that. And I'm like, bro, how you gonna how you gonna make I that? Can smell it right I, away. I, 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 I kind of chirp at him. I'm like, how you gonna make that assumption right? A guy barely talked and it could mean this and like, kind of giving the dude the benefit of the doubt on the conversation and the the further and deeper he went into this conversation. And it was a really intelligent type of uh, argument that he was building for to make a case. And so it it pulled you in. It pulled you in and, I, and I'm listening to it. And I'm like, oh, that's an interesting perspective to look at things that way. And Sal already is like shut down. He's just like, no, this is fucking stupid. <laughs> I'm like, bro, hang tight. But then as it unfolded, I totally figured I saw what Sal was talking about. And when it really revealed itself that I thought was hilarious was here you have this entrepreneurship son of it. I mean, and these people, most of these people paid big money to be at this event, right? So you don't have like want to be entrepreneurs. Almost everybody in that room was, was already successful. Were, or, yeah. yeah. And their mm -hmm. levels of success, like you were already, you already had a solid business. Some people had huge businesses. 
And uh, some of these speakers, Ramsey set it up to where you could ask them live questions afterwards. And it was comical how revealing it was, how little Malcolm Gladwell knew about building a business when people started to come up and actually ask him real tactical questions, like actionable on, things they could and do. And he got, he would he get philosophical no with his answer every time and talk in circles and never had like, and I remember leaning over and being like, Oh my God, I have something I would have sell that person yeah. easily that would help that person. Out. Oh my God, I have something that I, that I've done in my business that would have helped that person. Like, and there was lots of low hanging fruit yeah. to give advice to these entrepreneurs. And he just couldn't Look, give the, them the anything. People who are like, it's everybody else's fault. Uh, the the Marxist undertone that you're talking about. So I don't think he's he's, a, he's, a, he's not a Marxist, but he's it's that undertone, it's that energy. I can, I can I can hear it in the way he's explaining certain things, and it's this negative, blame everybody else. This is how we fix things by taking the top down type of stuff. And uh, I know I can smell it. And in what it, it comes from, people who postulate. Mm -hmm. They don't act. They're not in the real world. They just yeah. sit. They're not in the arena. It's, no. It's they're, a conundrum they're, for a lot of professors in, in academia. Listen, there's always That's what been, it sounded like. It felt like it, we were, yes. I was in a, a, a lecture in college yeah. from a very intelligent professor. They've never actually professor. built something. And then, right. and then when, when the rubber met the road and people started asking like, all right, well, what I do then? If you're telling me my business is more like a soccer team and I should be more like this. Do you remember what he said about this? This, this guy, there, somebody- uh, piped up about, I don't remember what it was. I think it was a school district. And they were talking about how some teachers just aren't performing. And so what do we do? Like, do we pay them less or whatever? Maybe we got to get rid of them. And he's like, no, no, no. You really shouldn't fire teachers because it brings down the morale of all the teachers. I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah, he got a real bad seat. You, you know why? Because that's him. He's in that space. That's those. That's the, that's the, how, they, how they talk. By the way, you guys know that the history of academia hating uh, business people and capitalists or whatever you want to call them, merchants, it goes back way, 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 way back. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because academia in the day, they held the power. They were the ones that could read. Nobody else can read. They were the ones that could tell you what was in the books mm -hmm. and the Bible and whatever. So they gave you the information and they were exalted as these super beings. And then markets opened up yeah. and you had merchants, merchants yep. who were trading and were, you know, Dis quote unquote, stupid. The whole thing. They didn't read. They didn't know what was in the books, but they were building success and wealth and respect and the academics hated that they're mm -hmm. like we know things we know everything they don't know anything and it's just it's just where it comes from it's yeah. like the business teacher who's never started a business you yeah. ever listen to a business teacher tell you i mean that's what business? he sounded like he yeah. sounded like it, cause he's up here talking to a bunch of uh you know entrepreneurs and his speech was all he basically put every business in two buckets you're either a basketball team or a, a soccer team yeah right like every business is falls in this category yeah. and that we're moving away from this you know, hero ball, two or three superstars that carry a. It's a, all about a bringing the weakest. Pay for your high up. performers versus like, yeah, trying to just put all the money into the lowest. Yeah, so it's performers. all about us moving in this direction as a society towards everyone having a soccer team, and so you could. It was and I, and what I didn't wasn't sure about was how many of these entrepreneurs were trolling him, or how many of them actually were like baffled by the talk that they want. They actually wanted good answers. I don't know what their motives were, but it was hilarious to watch them come up and be like, okay, well, you I'm, feel I'm, the energy. I'm hearing yeah. what you're saying. Uh, so my, so we are more like a I'm basketball sure team. And, and if I want to move to a song, so should I do this with my staff or should I fire this person or should I pay they less or should I pay and like, and you could just hear him go, just didn't have an answer yeah. for anything. Not one person that came up there. Did he give like a solid answer to him? It's like, wow, how, how obvious was that now? And then that was the only speaker that was like that. Everybody rest, else was, everybody else was like amazing. a killer business. And then all the answers those, those guys had and, and, and girls had in their, in their live Q and a part was like, yes. now you could tell the difference of someone who's literally built multiple businesses and can actually give these people good advice. Yeah, it totally. Super. I got to tell, I got to say, I got to say something nice about John Deloney. What he's a, such a great human being. So yeah. this is a personal story. So he's up on Love stage and he's talking about uh, like, you know, anxiety and how to deal with it, how to stay present. He's talking about his own struggles. And as he's talking, like everything he's saying is re resonating. Like I'm listening to this man. And I'm like, oh God, that's me, dude. Like everything he's saying, like that's me, that's me. And I'm struggling with certain personal things at the moment. And I'm like, God, I, I, you know, this is some stuff is just so hard for me. So I texted him and I said, bro, I said, what a great speech. This is so much resonated. Immediately, 30 seconds later, hey, come back to the green room. Come hang out with me. So I'm like, mm -hmm. what? So mm -hmm. I go back there. Mm -hmm. Now remember, this is a huge event. So people like John Deloney is a big piece of it. It's a huge event. They got lots of stuff going on. 
the guy takes, I don't know how long he spent with me, 45 minutes, and literally sits down and like gives me a, because this is what he does, right? He does therapy, right? Yeah. He sits down, spends one-on-one time with me, and just we just great. go through shit. And it was just like, man, what a great human being. What a nice, yeah, that. just genuine person. But it's funny, he said something. He goes, he goes, uh, he goes, do you feel like you have a, like a nuclear reactor? And I'm like, what? And he goes, the closer people get, the more the more you poison them with your, like, yeah, dude, I don't let anybody close. He goes, yeah, that's me too. Like, oh, shit. So he's like giving me tips and stuff. So anyway, <laughs> he what, came, a, what a great guy. He came up and, and visited Justin and I in our room on the first or second night. I don't remember what night it was. And yeah. uh, shared his experience with the meeting us for the first time. Oh, really? Yeah, it was cool it was just to hear him because we were just talking about, uh, we, were ta- we were gossiping. We are talking about other people, right? All these other, you know, famous people that we've been interacted with and met and just how many times we've been let down by people we were so excited to meet. He was actually talking about how amazing Jordan Peterson was. Oh. He said that Jordan Peterson blew his mind on like how uh, connected he felt to him when they met in person. He goes, man, someone yeah. like that who everyone's fighting for his attention. You think there's all these walls and he's going to be standoffish. Yeah, he says he, was the opposite. he looks like into your soul when he talks to you. Wow. He goes, it, it almost feels uncomfortable Vulnerable. because, yeah, because how much he is listening yeah. atten- attentively to you, what you have to say and what's going on with you. And he's like, Man, and he, and then when he responds, he says he he feels so empathetic and caring. He's like just an un. He said it blew his mind on how he was, but th- it started with that conversation and then led into like the connection that we had the first time. He's like, I knew as soon as I walked in the room with you guys that we were all going to be friends. He's like, you could just you could just tell that we were the same, we were cut from the same cloth. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I'm like, yeah, I, I think we all felt the same way too. I said it's just rare. I said you don't. It is. It's rare to meet really good people anyway, but especially in media. Mm-hmm. You don't meet like a lot of really, really genuine good. They appear to be, and then you meet them in person. Well, most stuff. people are actors. <laughs> That's what I mean. Most yeah. of them are are are, yeah. are 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 really good actors and have done a good job of whatever persona they are trying to project. And they've 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 gotten good at their craft, and have, and a lot of people you know get sucked into it. And I'm just as guilty of getting sucked into a persona or a person who I think is going to be a certain one, which is why I reserve judgment. Like I told Chris, I'm like, listen, man, I haven't spent enough one on one time with someone like Ramsey to even cast a judgment because I've already been wrong enough times yeah. and I've learned my lesson of speaking out of turn and being like, oh, this guy's a douche or, oh, this guy's amazing. And then you meet him and they're always, almost yeah. always the opposite. So, and from what I saw from that event, I mean, I, I really the got people this, he surrounds himself are amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Like yeah. every person we interacted with that worked for that, for that work, for that business. What, what was it, the name of the speaker, the Irish immigrant guy? Brian? Brian Buffini. Uh, Buffini. Was it Buffini? Yes. Yeah, Brian. Oh Buff- my. Fire. He comes dude. out and he talks about, he was so poor in Ireland, comes to America it's talking about immigrants. Yeah, and how about immigrant, the immigrant advantage. In fact, I took notes on like the advantages that immigrants have. But anyways, he's talking. I'm going to see if I can find it. As he's talking, I uh, it's it's resonating so strongly because that's how, that's my family. Mm-hmm. Like he he grew up in a, what, was yeah. he, what do you say, 700 square foot? So, yeah, ten, 10 people. 10, ten people, people. One, one bathroom. Bro, it was my dad. My yeah. dad actually, in fact, my dad, the that's first house he had me. didn't even have a bathroom. They had to go in an outhouse. And then when he grew they up- They all little, sleep like uh, staggered. It, and, yes. So he's telling this, you know, the-, the, the immigrant, All to be in this country too. Yes. You know yes. I, you know, and, and there, oh, there was a statistic. I'm going to find it. This is what he said, I look, and I, I confirmed it. It's a very interesting statistic, and it's uh, and oh, the I, success rate of entrepreneurs that were immigrants. So check this out: yeah, immigrants blew, that, that come away. to America are two to five times more likely to succeed than their same ethnicity uh, or color American-born counterparts. In other words, if you are an immigrant from Brazil, you do better than someone who's Brazilian but born and raised the, here. If you're Mexican, if you're Italian, if you're Irish, if you're uh, African, whatever, right. you're two to five times to, to be more successful Just, as an immigrant. Think about the... the and, the and the disadvantages of that. Yes, think strange. of the irony and, mm-hmm. the, and, the, and the challenges of that. Imagine us going to a country where you don't speak the language you don't and, have and connections. thinking that you're five times more likely to be successful than people that were born there. I would never go in with that no. assumption. So that, that, that's so counter... 
to what you would think. Like some, I know some people are going like, well, of course they have work ethic or they have, it's like, dude, think about that for a second. You're going to a place, yeah. you know, you have no connections. You're about privilege versus not privilege. Right. You yeah. have, you have no connections. And you're it's at saying, a like, massive disadvantage yes. yet you're five times more likely to be successful. What is it? It says a lot about mindset. It's yeah, everything. It says a right. lot about mindset. And again, they're comparing same ethnicity, same color, because people are like, well, you know, racism. This, no, no, no. You take someone from a country and you compare them to the person who comes, who has that same ethnicity, but is now two or three generations mm -hmm. here. And they're two to five times more likely to be successful. It's the attitude. It's knowing what you got. Right. It's that uh, drive. It's the drive. It's the opportunity that you that you realize and that you recognize. Mm. And the gratitude uh, and the gratitude. It's just uh, it's un an unbelievable statistic that you can't lie. That data doesn't lie. Right. Yeah. So anyway, do yeah, you guys a powerful speech? Very do you powerful. feel like in your family? Because I mean, you you you're you're such a great example of this with your dad, and then what all of you and your and your siblings have done and stuff like that. Do you, and maybe you do this for your family, because my fear, if I'm you or I'm even in my situation, is that, you know, as the generations get out, right, and, and, they're, and they're born into wealth, that they lose that, that, that spirit, right, that immigrant spirit of do anything at any cost to make it happen. Do you think there's things that either, one, you already currently do as a family to embody that, or do you think about that, like, you know, how... How can I remind my children and my children's children of what they came from and stuff like that? Do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, we talk about it a lot. Um, it's it just, I, I don't know. It's a hard thing to put your finger on, right? I think I saw my parents. They didn't preach to me. It's not like they sat down and preached to me what you got to do. Mm. I just, it was all just through just action. modeled, yeah. Yeah, they were very honest. They didn't spend money uh, on things that they didn't need. It wasn't a, a conversation, like I said. They worked very hard. Uh, my dad would take me to work with him in the summers or if I didn't have school. And I just witnessed how he was with his customers, the the type of pride he put into his work. My mom, uh, same thing. So I, I just saw it all. And then when I would hear stories as a kid, you don't know what to make of it until you get older. Like my dad would always tell me, oh, I shared a bed with you know four of my siblings and we lived in this tiny little thing. And you hear it as a kid. It's because you hear it all the time. You're like, whatever. Mm -hmm. Then you get older and like, wait a minute. You were, you were 18 years old and you slept in, they had two twin beds that they put together. My grandma will put a sheet over it to hold it together. And him and his siblings would sleep like foot, head, foot, head, foot. So they could all fit. Mm -hmm. Like this is 18, 18 year old kid yeah. working, giving money to his mom. Like at that point, right? They didn't even have a phone at the time. In fact, I remember my parents, when my parents moved here or they got married in order to get on the phone with my grandma, they had to call a neighbor and say, hey, can you get my mom to come over? I'll call back in, in 30 minutes, and then they call back, and then they could talk because they have a <laughs> That's phone. That's crazy. Because it was too expensive. You know? Yeah, like I feel like it, what, there would be tremendous value in like, you know, organizing a – I don't know. I think you should have your kids volunteer. That's what I keep hearing. Well, I, keep that, I know. About, I yeah. mean, I think that's a, you've already said that before. I think that's a good story. But even like having, like having your, like, I don't know if you guys have photos and having like a slideshow with the kid. Like, I feel like you have, you have a boy right now who's turning, getting ready to turn 18 yeah. years old. And what a, what a valuable piece of like, you know, heritage that you have to share with him. Like, of like, this is, you know what you, you know what's going on in your, your grandpa's time, what he yeah. was doing right now at your age. Like, this is what it, and painting that picture and maybe not so much coming from you, but coming from him. And then like discussing that and talking yeah. that. I just, I know Jordan Peterson says, don't do for your kids what they can do themselves. This, I, I think I, I'm not super good at. He says, by the way, he says, that's the most crippling thing you I can know. do. He says, the most crippling thing you could do for your kids is to do things they can do for themselves. Yep, yep, yep. Uh -huh. And I wasn't always uh, definitely good at that. Uh, that's something I had to work on because you just want to take care of your kid. Yeah. But uh, you don't. they don't build confidence or resilience or responsibility uh, or respect. They don't respect things, uh, you know, that way. Yeah. So Well, especially when they have more things. When it, It's different. Like if it's you doing things for your kid when you have nothing, but then as you start to have abundance and you do a lot of things for them, it's probably even worse than it is in, in the situation like what you're- You ever seen, yeah. I, you know, I had a, I had some friends that were really wealthy growing up and their parents would like buy them whatever. And I remember the way they would treat their stuff. Yeah. Like I remember being like, dude, you got, mm -hmm. you got like the newest Nintendo, you got all the games and they just like leave the games out and give a shit or whatever. Or, you know, they got this new car for their 16th birthday. And Smash they, their bike, like, immediately. Yeah, yeah. Draw, throw their bike on the ground. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, it's because it wasn't, like, valuable yeah. to them, you know, Didn't versus, like, it. like I bought my first, yeah. you know, car. And it was a piece of crap. But you better believe I washed that thing every weekend and 
made sure I treat Dude, I was so, I know. you know, that reminds me, like, so it was such a big deal for me. My grandma would, I don't know, every probably six months or so, buy me a pair of, like, nice, like, ba- basketball shoes. And ba- this was the era of the Jordans coming up, and so yeah. sneakers were now getting in that $100. $100 for sneakers was, like, Back in. then, that was, like, $10 million. Yeah, it was yeah. insane. <laughs> and so I would wear, I won, I would only wear my shoes on the court. And then off the court, they would get on my back. And then when they came home, I wouldn't even put them on the floor in my room. I put them up on like a, a shelf, oh, you know. Hilarious. And I would clean them every day. Did you day. wipe them? Oh them? yes, bro. Yeah. Every day, I clean them. They stack them. And it's like it's like their own little altar. It's yeah, <laughs> dude. It was it's wild to think that you know when that that when you know coming from at that age, like that was so, such yeah. a big deal. That and you're right. Like I had friends that were rich kids that had you know fifty pair and same thing. Had Nintendo games. They were laying out all over the place. Oh man, I can't find it. It's missing. It's like yeah. I can find my three. I know right where they're. <laughs> yeah. at. <laughs> yeah. Organized, put away, clean the same place. So it's in a frame on the wall. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Now my <laughs> my uh, my son's friends think I'm I sell meth. So there's oh that. yeah, that's right. <laughs> so you're the yeah. meth dealer that well, like, <laughs> that, has, that got, hasn't permeated. It's, it's you have to play with that. I, I swear have. to God, you have to. <clears throat> we should actually, get you like a lab coat and just some goggles, and every once in a while you walk out, or you, you pick the kids up from I'll school. Just like, like I'll that. just rent like an RV and just have like smoke like. <laughs> coming out of it and uh yeah no i actually ran uh past that kid like when i was picking up ethan at school it was funny because it was just like i was like hey man yeah. hey tell, tell your dad to call me yeah. he owes me something yeah, that's real right quick, yeah right? i'm He's here got, he has to call me for his midnight. orders yeah <laughs> dude how cool was the uh the hotel that we stayed in the gaylord is that that was the name of it right gaylord, gaylord yeah, opryland yeah opryland yeah, Opry land. Opry land. yeah. so there's multiple of those i didn't I first thought- of all it's not a hotel it's a resort yeah. It's, yeah. A resort, it's a resort, bro. Yeah. It is crazy. I, I've it's never under been under a dome. I've yeah, never been in thing. anything like that before. No, there's a water park, arcades. There's Shaw. It feels like a combination of like a Vegas casino without the gambling, like that, like yeah. where they do all the displays. It's exactly like, what it like a of. Disneyland or something. I don't know. It was it was insane. So I'm I really want to go back for Christmas because I hear Christmas is insane in there. Yeah, Supposedly right. they spend like months preparing and decorating the entire place, like Christmas theme. How cool would the kids to be there if it's like like all Christmas so light? Cool. It was already lit up kind of cool. I mm-hmm. can't imagine if they go all out for Christmas, uh, what a cool experience Dude, I, that would be. It was cool for me. Uh, did you guys see all the Mennonites walking around? Yeah. I've never seen like in person Mennonites. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I have either. There were dudes walking around. They had the haircut and the overalls yeah, and yeah. the moms with all the kids and they were all dressed a particular way. Yeah. But I can't, the kids look so cute. There's now, little boys know, walking around with the overalls and everything with the haircuts. Now, do like, you know, Doug, or, who, or do you, any of you guys know like the difference of, of like, like the, like Mennonites and then what, what would they fall under? Would they fall under like a, t- a type of Christianity or it's they Christianity. Told, it's Christianity. And um, so, and like, they're not as, they're not from what I read like, on Wikipedia. So if I get this wrong, sorry. Cause I, when I saw so many of them, I was like, really interested i'm like how do they live what's going on I, I said hi to a lot of them i thought it was so interesting and uh they're not like amish in the sense that they're not limited to an era of technology but they do limit their use of technology so they can still use phones and stuff but they're much stricter than like the average person so so it is and similar strict, to like, amish but it's without as much restrictions yeah amish is a whole nother level with that kind of stuff but they from what i read i wonder if it's like comparing like a catholic to like a new age christian Maybe because they're they're both they're they're both following from you know the, the same the, book the, the same book but then they've you know like are uh, someone who would be like a new age Christian today versus a Catholic but there's like strict like like marriage rules like fundamental like versus, how you behave yeah. type rules and this is again this is Wikipedia so I don't know but yeah interesting. how big is the is the the community in comparison to Amish do you know like if it's uh like similar in size I, I know that there's different. There's and do different are, are, Mennonite groups and like are you are you is, is it more likely that you like where it comes like is it someone who was maybe Amish and then they broke they broke off and then they do something like similar? no I think that the the their their leader's name was uh, Menno or something like that so they're Mennonites from this particular guy that broke off from the some traditional Christian sect. Oh. Again, this is Wikipedia. Yeah, I know. I have I don't know anything about that sect of Christianity. I mean, I'm just curious too. Like it's not like I mean You I, know what's funny? As a, when I was younger, I used to scoff at all religion, okay? This is why I became an atheist a long time ago. Not anymore, but I, this is what I was. And when I would see someone be that quote unquote extreme, I used to think, "Oh, how stupid, how oppressed, you know, terrible." Right. Now, as an adult, seeing how the world is and all the insanity and craziness that's going on, 
there's a big piece of me that's like, yeah, I think they might have figured yeah. some stuff out. <laughs> there's a lot less chaos, you know? Uh, like they're, they're all in kind of like standardized uniform clothes. And well, you, I almost understand why you have to create so much structure. working together, community. There's a lot tighter community feel. Yeah, like you have to create so much structure in a world that gives you everything, everything you want. Yeah. Like, of course you're going to have to do that. I mean, look at fitness and nutrition. You got to create all the structure around it because otherwise you eat whatever you want and you never move. Yeah. So they just did it with everything else. So that's why that's why part of me is like, huh. I, I mean, it's a good analogy actually to tie it back to that because come we, to work we, we are we are <laughs> bro, the haircut. I want you to do the haircut. The haircut the, already, please. And the beard. Please, please. Andrew, like can you the, put like a little thing? Okay, awesome. The it's, beard that just oh my god, like like the, the, the bucket handle beard. What do you call that? <laughs> <laughs> it goes down like this. Yeah, yeah no, I don't know. Good times. Did you find any information, Doug? Or? Yeah. So they actually have a common heritage. It's called Anabaptists. Uh, but they've been separate groups uh, since 1693. Wow. And they migrated separately to North America, but often settled in the same areas. And I think there's about a million Mennonites. Uh, a million? Right now, yeah. And they, it, so it, there it must have been a lot of them Baptist. right there. Anabaptist. I don't know what that means exactly. Uh, maybe oh. some type of, obviously, related to Baptist. You guys ever play uh, uh, Super Smash Bros.? Yeah, what? doesn't it sound like a character there? What? Mennonite. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds exactly like that. Stupid. Yeah. <laughs> you know what's funny about this though? People, again, uh, secular people who scoff at this kind of stuff, we are so arrogant to think that we're so smart and we know everything that look, if something's lasted hundreds of years and there's a million people that follow it, it's not because they're forced. They're in America. Okay. Yeah. They're not forced. Uh, and I now I know the whole like community, and if you grow up in it, you don't want to leave your community type of deal. Fine. But there's some value there that you can't ignore. There's something there that they find valuable. Well, look at the Amish have that, that what's that, the, what do they call it? Um, oh, where, where they, they get, are, they they get to go out. Yeah, they get to leave the and go come back. They R almost all do. Rob Springer the, or something like that? Yeah, this, this percentage of the R ones R that return. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> I mean, I find that really interesting, right? That, okay, yeah. they, they, they build this community, they family, they have all these strict rules and principles that they live their lives by. And, you know, one might, the outside looking in, go, oh, that's so oppressive. And then they get to a certain age where the, probably the parents agree. I don't know what age that is. I think 18. it's 18, right? And that this is, Okay, you're adult. Yeah, go do go experience you want. world. Go and they go crazy, right? They go absolutely insane for that whatever time period it is. But I think the percentage of them that come back to the community and culture yeah. is, is high. Like I said, what does that say to you? Well, like I said, like first of all, depression, anxiety, very low in these communities. Illness across the board, physical illness, very low. Uh, they live longer. Uh, so I don't know. And you look at like across the board with, with what about? I bet you they've done rating uh, happiness scores too. High. Right. Yeah. Very high. If you look at like, uh, uh, like, uh, some, you know, some of the other testing that they do when it comes to, like I said, depression is better. Anxiety is better. Physical illness, uh, tends to be better. Oh, that's what I was going to say. When you look at cultures with stricter marriage guidelines, like arranged marriage or whatever, right. they they tend to be happier. Divorce rates are a lot lower yeah. and people are like, yeah, but don't you want to like date more people, move in with people, you know, test people out before whatever Th these dating apps are showing. That actually is not yeah. the case. Less people are satisfied yeah. with these dating apps. They're less likely to be in these committed relationships and find you know that value or whatever. So, like I said, I don't know if that's the answer, but there's some value there. Yeah, if it's lasted that long, it's, you do know, you think it's that something, something you can extract from it for sure? Yeah. Do you yeah. think those implode in our time? Do you think we're going to see like like this like right now we're in the heart of like the the middle of this like trend on mm. on the dating apps because more and more the it, it started off with all this positive. Uh, research right yeah. oh two in every four relationships you know meet online yeah, yeah whatever the number is right and that all this positive stuff of oh so many people get married from these things and like now that they've been around for long enough we're yeah. seeing this the the level of dissatisfaction dissatisfaction thank you gotcha. i don't know why i couldn't find that today no problem. Um, so, the, you know, if we're seeing that now come out. And so are we going to start to see people go, oh man, this isn't the way to Here's do it. Here's what I predict. I predict mm -hmm. you're going to see the rise in, uh, stricter, um, disciplines. Mm -hmm. So as a reaction, so you've got this like extreme variety, freedom, just across the board, which I think is going to cause a reaction of more and more people to be like, uh, no, I'm going to be in this discipline that has these guidelines and these rules because I need it. 
in this in this world. Now, based on that, wouldn't you assume like then, people getting flip well, phones right now? Did you, you guys see that? Yeah, I, yeah, I know that. Yeah. I know no fap. All those things are like an example yeah. of what you're saying. The flip phone move is cool, but didn't, <laughs> yeah. wouldn't that be an example though? I mean, or shouldn't we see a a rise though in religion though based off that? Because those are well, obviously you've seen that right. Like in terms of uh, the Latin version bit. of uh, uh, Catholicism is yep. like up is up like substantially like yep. people go into mass to just like and then you can't even understand what they're saying it's latin just, math math it, yeah latin so mass. yeah i would like to see a, uh, i'd like to see because when i read iGen, which i don't know how many years that book is now it's it's you know it's probably a good five six years old now the stats on that was the opposite that there's been a a, a massive decline in in religion well you're seeing a, a rise now. in in disciplines like people are doing ocr races cold baths uh like all these extreme things uh to try to create discipline and structure so i think religion is going to follow that's my that's my opinion yeah, i think you're gonna i don't know if it's gonna be like this huge like uh awakening you know but i think you're gonna yeah. see Speaking of the awakening, did you watch? Did you, I know split. you watched? You brought it up. Did you watch the Jesus Revolution? I haven't watched it yet. Did you really watch it? I did. I watched it. It was yeah. good, huh? Very good. Actually. It was really, yeah. really good. Yeah. And I, the, the the historical stuff with the Time Magazine, and then like like them listing this as like one of the biggest revolutions ever historically, like that that we've ever had any sort of documentation around. I thought that was really. Fascinating. I got myself choked up multiple times. Me too. Times. I, did. I, tell, Me too. I, was, I was on the plane, like fighting back tears. Dude, like, like, part, I tears. I'm like, I don't know why this is getting I'll me. I'll tell you the one scene that got me the most, right? There was this. So just for people to know, it's basically like this church that's kind of, you know, struggling to get more people. And this hippie dude shows up and he's like preaching. And at the time that was the counter revolution, right? So this, the, this preacher lets him in. And uh, a lot of the people in the congregation didn't like him because he was bringing all these hippies in. Mm. They're dirty. They're you know they're kind of weird. They're all is this where that whole Jesus freak uh, movement yes. came yes. from? Yes, mm -hmm. okay. yes. Yeah. And so there's a scene where they take the the lead pastor aside, this, the, the people who are part of the original congregation, and they're like, we can't keep having these dirty hippies coming in and they're complaining they're like they're getting the rug, the the, the new carpets all dirty with their dirty <laughs> bare feet or whatever. Oh, yeah, so the next day. Yeah they all walk up and there's this huge line of these hippies, right? That are all kind of trying to come in and follow. And the dude is sitting at the door washing, washing everybody's feet. feet yeah. Yeah. And okay. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah that's oh, dude, that ultimate. Act yeah, there was a lot of, I mean, even if you're like, again, I don't, if you can be completely atheist and enjoy that. I thought that the acting was done really well. Was well I made. also thought it did a really good job of even showing how, you know, and this is what I think when I was growing up, uh, the challenge that I had with, you know, feeling like I was indoctrinated with religion as a young kid and then getting older and wiser and seeing, and then seeing the hypocrisy mm -hmm. and seeing also too the, you know, that humans, men are flawed and are power driven, ego driven. And that you saw that follows you anywhere. Yeah. And it doesn't matter where you're at. And you see that kind of happen with that guy. Like it, it has this kind of pure, source and a pure message and appear at the very beginning and then over time as the as the fame grows and the notoriety grows and the attention grows you can see the ego grow within the person who is now you know originally saying that this is all for god or through god evolve and happen and so i, I thought they did a really good job of depicting like it wasn't like this one angle of i'm going to tell this story c.s you know? lewis book screw tape letter is really good right it's a fictional story of like these devils talking about how they can influence people. And in one segment, they talk about how this guy, like th this little demon guy, his his guy, uh oh, he's going to church. What am I going to do? And then his uncle, who's like this really experienced guy says, just make sure you point out to him how the people go into the church with him are not perfect. Make sure you point out how that guy over there is a gambler and how that guy over there is kind of not, not paying attention. So it's like, that's, that's part of the game, right? It's like, it's like fitness. It's like uh, you get into fitness you follow fitness people, and then you realize they're not perfect. They're not mm -hmm. perfect fitness people. Oh, oh so screw true. fitness. Well, that's not what it's all about, they're right? All we're all yeah, we're all people, dude. We're all flawed. Like uh, we've said this before, the fitness industry is full of body image issues and poor health practices. Uh, so it's like anything else, right? I what, I remember training lots of clients like that that got turned off by the fitness space because they found out some you know, fitness body that they follow. Yeah, eats cheeseburgers or something. Yeah, or does drugs or is this or that. And it's like, and then all of a sudden they just discredit the, the entire idea and space. And it's like, oh, then they're, yeah. they're narcissistic. Or if they're angels, they're people. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, yeah. I've definitely seen that. No, 100%. Yeah. Hey, I want to bring up a, take a little left turn. I'm going to bring up a study on beetroot powder or beetroot juice. Let me pull it up here real quick for you guys. So uh, I've brought this up before. There's a compound in beetroot 
powder or juice or beetroot juice that's called that are called nitrites. And these nitrates have been shown to increase uh, things like stamina endurance, actually quite effectively. Well, there's a new study uh, that was just was published uh, this year that shows that ingesting nitrates from beetroot powder, uh, so dietary nitrates, also increases muscle force, 7 to 10%. Mm. So it's not just stamina and endurance, it's also strength. Wow, it increases your strength force. Also there, increases huh? strength. So this is a popular endurance supplement right now, but it's making the case that this is also good for strength training. Hmm. That you could take something like this. Now is all so I remember when products like uh it'll explode and I forget what some of the brand names of the other. So those are trying to increase nitric oxide. Nitrates actually do it in a big way. So that's what I think that might be why. So what I was gonna ask you was so I remember when those hit the scene, but I don't think those were based off of beetroot. Uh uh. So those those were using it maybe other formulas. Arginine, citrulline. Stuff okay, like that. Stuff like that combined to, and, and back then it was in theory. In theory, if yeah. you took this stuff, it, we, we, we believed it would increase the nitric oxide in, in your right. blood, right? Yep. So, but over time, as all this stuff is washed out, we've found that beetroot juice is the most effective way to do that. Yeah. So, like, uh, you can either drink it. Ooh, that's gross. I don't know if you've ever, do you like beets? <laughs> no. Oh, I hate beets. No, I've had, you ever had, like, I had, it was chocolate cake that somebody put it in before. Why? I don't know why. They're tricking you. It tasted like chocolate cake with dirt. <laughs> it oh. like, yeah, it was no, me. I had uh what's that what's that one like healthy uh replacement for chocolate, Doug? Back in the day, people Oh, I know you're talking about. Uh I can't think of it offhand. Oh God. It was like a 70s, 80s thing. Like, well, it's not chocolate. It's Nutella? It's, no. no. That's not <laughs> It's good. Just as old cheese nachos. That's not the same category. I love cheese nachos. Uh, it starts with a C. Ca cow? No, ca carob. Carob, yeah, that's carob. it. What you is guys that? ever have carob? No, I never even heard that. Bro, when I was a kid, I had this friend that his mom was like super crunchy, hippie or whatever, and we had a carob cake. What? I've never heard It was that. a replacement for chocolate. It tastes how nothing disappointed, like chocolate. How disappointed were you? Yeah, it's general. a very poor it's substitute. Dark. It's not chocolate. chocolate. I don't know why they, because it has the same color. I don't know. It's disgusting. Oh my God. It doesn't even taste like it? No. I remember eating it. Yeah. It was a big thing there for a while. It was. Disgusting. Anyway, uh, you could either drink beetroot juice, you could eat beets, or you could buy the powder, which actually tastes pretty good. So Organifi's red juice. That's one of the bases of the powder. I like the way that tastes. Yes. Yeah, it's got it. Yeah. Plus, it's got the rhodiola, which is an adaptogen. So it's yeah. a good pre-workout that's non-stimulant based that now studies are showing will increase not just stamina endurance, but strength. Yeah. strength and well. you should get a better pump, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So getting yes. a better pump on it and strength increase. No, it's a solid. For sure. If somebody who does not use caffeine, it's the, uh, to me, I think one of the most ideal supplements that awesome. you could mess with. Awesome. All right. Let's do our shout out. I already brought him up, Doug. Can we just do hit the shout out with, uh, with let's uh, do Brian. Brian? Yeah, Brian. Yeah. Brian? yeah. So Brian. The Irish Buffini, guy, right? You got to, he's hilarious. Uh, great storyteller. He became very successful for, from nothing. He has a podcast too. You know that? He does. Yeah. What's his podcast called? The Good Life? The Good Life. Life. The, the Good, Good Life. Life. Yeah. Uh, so check it out. You can find him. Is that his Instagram handle? Doug? That's his Instagram. Yes. Brian underscore Buffini. B-U-F-F-I-N-I. -F -F -I -I. So go check this guy out. You having trouble falling asleep? Is your sleep quality not great? Want to have improved recovery? better growth hormone levels while you sleep, better muscle gains and fat loss, better discipline because you got better sleep. Well, check out this company. It's called Sleep Breakthrough. It's a pre-bed drink that combines the power of magnesium with other natural ingredients like valerian root. So it'll help you fall asleep faster, stay asleep longer, and wake up feeling refreshed. Go check them out. Go to sleepbreakthrough.com forward slash mind pump. Use the promo code mind pump 10 for a discount. All right, back to the show. All right, first caller is Brianna from Arizona. Hey, Brianna, how can we help you? Hi, guys. Good morning. How Thank are you? you so very much for having me on your show today. I just have to start off by saying how huge of a fan I am of you guys. I listen to the show every single day, multiple times a day, at work, at the gym, in the car, and I'm always recommending it to uh, everybody I talk to, pretty much. Awesome. So, Champion. very excited to be here today. Awesome. And thank you for all the awesome information you guys are putting out there. Really enjoy all of your guys' perspectives on things fitness and non-fitness related. Beautiful. Sweet. Thank you. How can we help you? 
Um, okay, so my question, I actually have uh, three questions and one of them, the main one has a couple branch off questions. So I have a very severe imbalance in my upper body and my back and my shoulder. Um, and it comes from the work that I do. So I work at Trader Joe's and I'm a stalker, of course. So I'm stocking stuff all day long using my dominant right side, of course. Um, and so therefore, and I'm not sure if you've seen the picture that I've uh, sent in or not, but um, definitely have a pretty striking imbalance on my right side. And the picture that I sent to you shows me about a year ago and then from about a week ago. So I think that what I'm seeing is that I have made some improvement over the last year. Um, but I'm kind of wondering from your guys' perspectives, um, a couple things. A, like what muscles are involved here in this imbalance? And then B, like a, from your guys' perspective, is the imbalance still pretty severe or have I made sort of enough progress to where I can start doing um, bilateral movement again? Because I would say I do unilateral movement probably about 75% of the time, but I my goals are mostly strength goals. So I really want to get stronger at like say a shoulder or an overhead shoulder press. Um, and right now I feel like I shouldn't be doing a whole lot of um, bilateral stuff on my upper body because of the imbalance. Okay. Let me ask you mm. a couple questions, Brianna. So the imbalance, is this something you noticed visually or did you notice pain and dysfunction in your body? Because you can have a visual, what appears to be a visual imbalance, but it not really affect necessarily movement and function. And then you can have an imbalance where you've got pain and it's affecting your ability to do exercises and particular movements. So where, where do you fall on that? Yeah, actually, that's a great question. I was going to bring that up. It's only visual. So I had no idea there was an imbalance until I took a picture of my back one day and saw it. And I was like startled by it. But I also was very weirded out by the fact that I don't feel like I have a strength imbalance like whatsoever. If anything, I feel like the strength imbalance could be more on my um, on my, the not dominant side. So on my left side, I feel like that could be slightly stronger than the side that's actually overdeveloped. Okay, good. That's, um, so that's, a, that's actually a good place to be. So if there was pain, uh, movement dysfunction, this would be much, you know, more We'd of, have to a, go of more a concern corrective, yeah. when it's visual, not that it's not a big deal. Um, because if it's like a big, big, because I'm looking at you right now, like if I just saw you walking around, I wouldn't she's necessarily. Already, she's already made good progress too. Yeah. yeah you've, you can see the difference. You've made some progress. It's not like it's like this big, big deal where I saw you on the street and I'd be like, oh my God, what's going on? I'd have to really look at what's going on. You could also just be holding one side a little differently. So it might not be a muscular development imbalance, but rather how your body is comfortable and how it holds itself. So what I would do with a client like you is if I saw something like this, I would, of course, assess movement. That's the first thing I'd do. See if I notice any strength imbalances or, or stability imbalances. And then I'd have them get a really good deep tissue massage and I'd look at them again. Because sometimes mm -hmm. what happens is one side is being held a little bit differently and the deep tissue massage tends to tell the body to relax. And then you notice that the imbalance, the visual imbalance tends to kind of disappear. So you're saying you don't notice a strength or or pain imbalance, you're already making some progress. I think what you're doing is is good. I think you're kind of on the right track and I wouldn't worry too much about it unless it's affecting movement and causing pain and you're noticing things with your exercises and your workouts where there's a, there's a big difference. So the, the one thing I, I would add to that is uh, because it isn't, it isn't causing any sort of pain or discomfort. So there isn't this like this crazy urgency, but just because you're aware of it now. Mm -hmm. So the shoulder is slightly elevated, right? And so retracted the, just yeah, a bit. Yeah. So it's, it's going to, it's rolled up and forward a little bit. So whenever you do exercises, being mindful of retracting and depressing the shoulders, right? So that will help, right? While you plus doing unilateral work, plus working towards his butt. If, if I have a client who's not, we don't see a major strength, strength discrepancy. There's no pain going on. I'm seeing progress while she's already, I'm not going to worry too much about it. I'm just going to continue to remind her as we're we're doing exercises like a seated row. I'm going to see that you're naturally going to be elevated on one side. I'm going to say, oh, depress that shoulder down, pull the shoulder blades back and down in the pockets. And I'm going to make cues like that just to help remind. And just you becoming more and more aware of it as you do exercises, as you're moving throughout your day, is going to probably continue to improve this. Yeah, and on top of that, I mean, it really, it's just about uh, adding in some of those drills and mobility drills that you've you've been doing that have 
brought you a little bit more uh, balance uh, into your workouts. So you start going more bilateral. Uh, you prime every time ahead of time, and, and you're just cognizant of that. Like you have that little bit of a shift as asymmetry there. Uh, but obviously, we don't want to exaggerate it, but it's not inhibiting you or like limiting you in any way. Uh, but to, to be able to kind of like just take that time ahead of time or, or just do things like posture walks. Uh, so you're just, you're just consciously kind of making that effort of like trying to make sure that everything's bracing properly and you're in good postural positions so you can distribute force well, because you don't want to be in a position where, you know, you have that asymmetry and you're, you're now adding a lot of load, uh, that you're going to start kind of building compensations towards. So if you, you address it right away and you kind of work out and train, it'll help kind of reiterate more of the better patterns. Yeah. Cause I, I mean, I'm looking at the after picture, I could see some improvement, but if I was standing there while you took that picture, I would make sure that your positioning was the same on both sides. Cause I, it looks like if I, if I made your left side match your right side in terms of positioning, I don't know if we would notice. Mm -hmm. now, I can't say that for sure. But I don't know if I would if I would notice a difference because the difference appears to be the way you're holding yourself. Now that doesn't mean there isn't a difference. That means that there's a difference in how you're holding yourself uh, when you're relaxed. But it doesn't necessarily mean there's a development uh, yeah. difference or a hypertrophy difference. So have I, you had a deep tissue massage? I, I imagine that would play play a, a big factor. Yeah. And that's interesting that you say that too, because, um, my right side, my right, like shoulder, I actually have to ask my husband like probably twice a week to like immediately deep tissue massage me yeah. because the pain will kind of, um, build up just a lot of like lactic acid and stuff. Um, but I, I, the last time I had a deep tissue mas massage was probably about a year and a half ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you could do, you could get like a lacrosse ball. Um, or you could use like the corner of a door or you could have your husband work on those areas just to kind of relax them. Cause what happens after you, after you work on a hypertrophy imbalance, let's say that the, the, the memory of how you hold yourself kind of sticks around sometimes until, you, you know, you change your, your natural positioning. It, it does look to me like you're just holding yourself that way, that it's not necessarily like a muscle imbalance in terms of hypertrophy. So I think that that would be the, the key. And then, like I said, I think what you're doing with the unilateral work, I would continue doing that uh, just because you're holding yourself differently, that if you go to a barbell, then you may start to notice some development uh, issues. So I would stick with the unilateral stuff uh, for a little while, especially to offset your work, because it sounds like you do a lot of uh, a lot of work with one side versus the other. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Definitely. Do you have okay. maps? Do you have map symmetry? Because that's like our best unilateral program. Right. No, I don't. I have anabolic and aesthetic, and so I just um, make everything unilateral. Of course, mm. um, symmetry. I've been meaning to to get. So we'll send oh, that to we, you. Yeah, definitely. You got, yeah, that's the symmetry. one you got to do. Yeah. Then we'll send that to you. You guys are awesome. Thank you. No problem. Um, do I have time for two more questions? Yeah. Okay. So my second question was um, also kind of symmetry in a way, but um, from top to bottom. So I feel like my leg lifts have gotten um, significantly, I've definitely gotten stronger in the last year. Um, for instance, I've added like almost over a hundred pounds to my deadlift. Um, I can't really speak to squat, unfortunately, because of a wrist injury, but um, I can speak to other leg exercises where I've definitely have seen strength increases. Um, and I have seen uh, muscular increases as well, but mostly pretty much all significantly in my upper body. So I'm just kind of wondering if that's like a genetic variance thing where maybe my lower body just doesn't doesn't want to build muscle as much as my upper body does or if that's something you guys hear of often well, well if you added 100 pounds to your deadlift your lower body is building muscle that's for sure so if you're 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 saying your your lower body right she's saying her lower body's not growing as much as or fast as her upper body i mean you put 100 pounds on your deadlift that's, yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> that's a right. big that's a big fucking deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I promise yes, it's true. It, and it's what you yeah. what you what you might be seeing and you might being uh you might be critical of yourself that maybe you don't see as much muscle definition in your legs as you have seen in your upper body, which that can be genetic, right? There's some people that just hold more body fat in their lower body than they do their upper body. And as they start to build muscle, it stands out more to them in their upper body than their lower body. 
But I guarantee mm-hmm. if you added 100 pounds to your deadlift, you definitely built some lower lower half muscle for sure. If you leaned out, you might see, like, so go even leaner than where you're currently at right now, and then maybe you'll see some of the hard work that you've yeah. done to build muscle there. That would be my guess. Brianna, do, did you play sports uh, in high school or college? Yes, I played uh, sports pretty much all through all through high school. Yep. What, what'd you play? Uh, basketball, soccer, track and field. I didn't really have any one that I stuck to the most. I just kind of did all sorts of them equally, but primarily soccer, basketball, track. Would you say that you have kind of like narrow hips in comparison to like the average uh, woman? Would you say you're a more narrow hip, wider shouldered kind of build or or is that inaccurate? Um, Yeah, I would. I would say maybe more like average. Okay. Um, yeah, the that reason, makes sense. The reason why I'm asking is female athletes uh, or women that tend to succeed uh, really well in sports tend to have more, uh, tend to have narrow, more narrower hips and have uh, and carry a little bit more musculature in the upper body. Not because of the sports, but that's just kind of their genetics. So here's what I'm saying. So you may build muscle faster in your upper body. That might be true. If that is true, just swap volume for upper body to lower body. So. You know, if you're doing, uh, you know, 10 sets for your back, maybe just do five, take those extra five sets and put it to lower body exercises. So you can modify your workouts so that you could put more work in one area and less work in another. What you don't want to do is just add volume and not compensate by reducing volume in other places. So you could totally do that. If you, How long have you been working out for? Uh, consistently two years. Yeah, you're, you're in a position where you could start to modify. So I would go ahead and have fun with that and experiment and see how it works. And if you're, if you want to just maintain your upper body, you could take a lot of the volume down and throw it to your lower body, give yourself five months and see, see what that looks like. Sure. Yeah. I also feel like part of the reason why I say I haven't grown muscle on my lower half is because it, I feel I'm actually very glute dominant and hamstring dominant versus quad dominant. Um, and so I feel like I haven't, I've been trying to grow my quads and I just do not see them growing at all. So maybe that musculature is going towards, you know, glutes and hammies. Um, and I'm just not seeing it on this, uh, in the part that I want to be seeing it. Well, this is also a way to address your third question, which I can read up there, which is to Sal's point is, you know, drop the shrugs and add a, add an exercise for your quads. Sure. So, so drop, yeah. drop the shrugs and do that. I mean, you're going to follow symmetry right now, which is my suggestion would be to be follow it the way it's laid out. Yeah, do that there's, not, there's not a ton of shrugs in there at all. So I would follow the way that's laid out. But in the future, like let's say when you move back to say anabolic or aesthetic, pull the shrugs out and replace it with some, you know, leg exercises. Yeah. How, how do you yeah. tend to store body fat, Brianna? Where, like if you were to gain weight, where does it go first? Um, definitely abdomen, Back, lower back and uh, arms. Okay, so look, here's the other thing too. Like, are you tracking? Do you have like uh, have you ever? What's the leanest you've ever been? And do you track your calories and protein and stuff like that? I used to track. I no longer do. Um, the leanest I was was probably about a year ago. Um, you can see in the picture that I definitely have gained some body fat since last year. Um, so yeah, that was the leanest I was at. Um, I don't. <laughs> I don't know if you're looking for calories or a percentage, but I'm really not clear on either of those. Yeah, no, no worries. I, I'm just the reason why I'm asking is because uh, some some women store body fat more in the upper body, and when they st- when they gain body fat, they feel bulkier in the upper body. So the reason why I'm saying this is at some point, if you ever decide to you know get down to let's say the low twenties or high teens in body fat percentage, the issue that you're noticing with the upper versus lower body may actually disappear. So I've had female sure. clients like this as well. When they get lean, it's like, oh, okay, it's it wasn't my upper body was super muscular. It's just that I tend to store body fat uh, more in my upper body. So that's another thing to consider. Yeah. But at the like ultimately modify your workout. That's where that's where I would take you. Follow symmetry as it's yeah. laid out. After that, start swapping out volume and and see how see how it works out for you. Okay, awesome. All right. Very good. Yeah. Thanks for calling Thank you in. So much, you guys. All right. Thank All right. you. I appreciate- all so much. This was a pleasure. Thank you, have, you so you much. Have a good, day. good luck with symmetry. Good Thank you. You as well. Goodbye. Bye bye. You know, years ago, I noticed a, a like a crazy imbalance on myself because when I was deadlifting like crazy, I got stuck mm. in the habit of having my right hand supinated, and my left hand pronated. This is, was my strongest grip, mm-hmm. and uh, I got a massage, and my massage therapist is like, "Oh man, the right, 
erector spinae is like so much more developed. And I'm like, what? You know, you never see your back. So I'm like, really? Yeah. So I remember I lay, I went up against the wall, put my back up against the wall and I could feel the difference. Wow. And then I, I that's when I switched to double overhand and it took me, <clears throat> it took me close to two and a half, three years to somewhat balance it. That's how long it could take sometimes. So yeah, yeah. When you have somebody like this where it's, it's not bothering her she can just see it a lot of times just now becoming aware of it and then learning to position yourself yeah in a the neutral position when you go to do lifts because what ends up happening is they they lift in that that you know position that's advantageous for putting things on the shelf yeah. and they go right in their lifts and then it just exacerbates it where if you yeah. are aware of it you can position yourself correctly doing unilateral work it'll start to kind of balance itself out just yeah. becoming aware of that well and it's interesting too when you go to deep tissue massage what that feels like right, right? and you, you're unaware of it because you do your less because it is beneficial to have tight muscles help support you know your joints and like you're able to lift uh, effectively in that direction but you know, once you kind of really like peer into that and see that discrepancy and address it it's 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 a lot of work yeah so for people <clears throat> listening right now your your cns you know obviously controls what your muscles do and it can tell some muscles to be partially tense all the time, all the time. because it's protecting a joint or because you use it so often. This is why you feel like you're tight or you have a knot. And then what happens when someone pushes on it real hard is the CNS gets this signal and it starts to relax the muscle. And so sometimes that's just how people walk around and the massage reveals it more than anything. Next caller is Stephen from Wisconsin. What's up, Stephen? How can we help you? Hey, guys. Just wanted to say thank you for everything you guys do. I've been listening for about three years and pretty often my friends and my girlfriend are like, Jesus, this guy's listening to Mind Pump again. Like they get on me, but it <laughs> doesn't matter. I'm still listening. So thank you guys. And I, it's my favorite thing to listen to either in the car or uh, in the shower, you know, anytime I can. So awesome. I love listening to Sal in the shower. It's my favorite. Wow. <laughs> wow. You're one it's of encouraging. Us. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. And ask your question. Man. All right, yeah. So I, I figure I'll just dive in. Then you guys can ask questions. Uh, of course. Based on mine. So my question is, what would be the best course of action for me as someone who is not able to get consistent nights of sleep because of work and baseball? And I want to gain strength and balance out the left and right side of my body because my right side is lacking heavily. Thinking about starting a program like Symmetry or maybe Max 15 and just making everything unilateral, but I'm not entirely sure how to balance my intensity with the new stress I'm having. Also playing baseball is my priority right now, and the gym comes as a close second. But I, ideally, I would not sacrifice my time at the gym because of baseball. Yeah, good question. What yeah. position do you play? I'm a catcher. Okay, and where's mm. your, so your imbalance is uh, right to left is what you're noticing. Big is it? Is it feel pretty pretty significant? Yeah, it's pretty significant, and I've had a, I ran into a lot of injuries in the past couple of years, and they all been on my right side. Okay, hmm. so and then what, how many days a week do you practice, and what does that look like? So in the summer, we're probably playing four or five days a week with double headers on Saturday and Sunday. Okay, that's a lot. That's a lot, yeah. I, I wouldn't do more than one day a week of of, yeah. of strength training and correctional exercise. That's it. That's the most I would do right now. Yeah, and just then mobility in between. Off season, you can add like a day or two, but literally right now, I would do one day a week unilateral work, uh, dumbbell type basic strength training. And then on the days that you practice, I would do lots of uh, correctional stuff before and after practice. So like, you know, 10, 15 minutes before and after. And that would be pretty much it. I wouldn't do any more than that because I think uh, more than that will, will do the opposite of what you're looking for. So what it would look like is a one foundational day from symmetry. So your your idea of running symmetry is right. I think just what you probably would have done is done too much because you got a lot going on with baseball already that one day a week of lifting full body is is plenty for you so do you have map symmetry already or no i do not no okay so we'll we'll send map symmetry over to you and then like i said i would pick i'd pick one day i don't know follow one day for three weeks and then pick another day follow it for three weeks that's kind of how i would train mm -hmm. uh and then like justin's suggestion is is doing some like mobility work in between but yeah do you have any of our mass programs so far or no no, I do not. I've been following some power building program that's been five days a week because it's what I'm into, but it really hasn't been working out well. Of course not. Yeah. Way too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely not. Yeah. Way too much. You know, another thing, Stephen, too, I noticed with with, uh, with guys your age is uh, their diet is typically lacking. So are you, are you hitting protein targets? Do you know how many grams of protein you're getting a day? Yeah, I mean, I'm shooting for 180 to 200. 
I mean, I'm more than likely not hitting that every day, especially on the weekend when we're traveling. It's hard to get our meals in. But yeah, my diet's been not the best as of late. So right. so tell me what the challenge is. Is it that you you just don't make the time or you don't wake up on time? A lot of guys your age it's just they wake up late and they get to get school or whatever. Like and you're just saying that's the target. What are you what are you doing to try to hit that? So during the week, like my meals are pretty consistent. The place where I run into trouble is if I'm at the field for eight to 10 hours on a Saturday or Sunday, and I'm just looking like it's hard to get like my normal meals in on those days, or especially like last weekend, we were in a hotel Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So my options were kind of limited there. All right. I would do shakes on those days. And on the days that you're home, I would definitely meal prep. Cause that's going to put you so far ahead of, of other guys your age. Like I don't, I, I, I am, I've never found a 20 something year old that gets anywhere near what they're supposed to with diet. That's always where they screw up. So that'll make a big difference with the, the fact that you're training so much and you feel like you're burning out. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I think you, you hit your protein and targets like Sal saying consistently for 30 days and you train the one day a week in symmetry. I guarantee you'll see a significant difference in with less training and just just hitting your protein yep. targets, what will happen in 30 days? Huge. Watch. Yeah. Well, I love, I mean, I love symmetry for you, obviously. I mean, selfishly, I want you to have performance as well, just for the mobility sessions. There's um, a real simple way to address a lot of like these movements for baseball, especially with with stick mobility. And so I worked with these guys for a while. Um, but there's there's lots of ways of really opening that up, getting external rotation with your shoulder, also addressing, you know, hips and ankles, lateral line. Um, and so, it, you know, there's, there's a couple of things too. So we did, we did two webinars, like between myself and Adam, uh, free f that we're showing our prime program and our, and our prime pro program, but really to, to be able to do a few of those moves, especially like consistently, uh, to just make sure you keep and maintain the health of the, these joints as you're adding all of this excess stress. Uh, I can't reiterate this enough is, is something that needs to be a daily habit. Well then hook them up with uh, performance also then. So yep. then the suggestion would look like this based off what Justin's telling you. And I agree with him is follow symmetry the program one day a week that's all you do for the foundational training and then the other days in performance we have what are called mobility days which are it's about 20 minute sessions of mobility like flow work we're like lizard with rotation 90 90s movements like that that you can insert during the week and honestly those you can't really do too much of that so as much as you can incorporate that into your routine incorporate that into your routine yep okay yeah so uh, especially with games during the week, I, I'm about an hour and 30 away. So I'm ended up getting home about midnight. And then what I've been running to the trouble is I got to get to work by nine. So I've been waking up at six to get to the gym and lift. So should I just kind of play it by ear when I hit that foundational day from symmetry? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Cause you only, yeah. exactly. I, I would pick it to do it on a day when you get the best rest. Cause you're only needing to do it one day a week. So make it the best day make it the day that you're honestly actually with your, your weekend. Well, if it depends, if you have a weekend off of baseball, if, if it's not one of your like, you know, double header, triple header yeah. type of tournament style. But if you have a day off on the weekend, since that's already a challenging day nutritionally for you, I, I'm a big one on winning the weekend. So like mm -hmm. I would actually try and make that, a day where I lift, I meal prep, I do all of that on that day, and then the rest of it. So I set my week up. Yeah, really dive in the performance mobility because you could actually like incorporate that into your actual warm ups before these games. Uh, so that right. way, you you know, you go through a lot of that instead of just like you know aimlessly sort of like warming up the muscles and getting cardiovascular um, sort of output with that. Like, be more specific about like getting engagement out of you know muscles that are supporting your joints. Okay. Yeah, definitely. And then for diet wise, should just focus on the protein because just focus on I'm, that for now. Just focus on yeah. you're you're young enough, you're active enough. I'm not worried if you eat a little bit extra fat or a little extra carbohydrates or a little extra yeah. calories. What I care about is you hit your protein intake. Now but, now here's one caveat. I don't want you to just do a bunch of shakes because if you do that, then you're not getting any carbs or fats either. Okay. So right. what Adam's saying is with, with you know, try and hit it with food. If you end up with five shakes a day and one meal, you're gonna want you're gonna want to throw some other stuff in with those shakes, like some some fruit or some 
something that's going to give you some other stuff too. So, and I, I'm saying that because I, I could picture, yeah, the, you know, 21 year old kid who's like, well, I had breakfast and I'm gonna have five shakes today. Yeah, imagine shakes yeah. and bars as an emergency only because you're you way behind yeah. and you're not there. The goal so should behind. be for you every day to try and hit your protein and take through through Whole Foods. And only if you need it, do you use the shakes and bars to get there. Just focus on that. I'm not really worried about additional calories that you have on yep. top of that. Just do that. Mm -hmm. And and that and the training one day a week, you're going to see a big difference. I promise. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And I probably won't run into the trouble with the shakes or the bars because anything more than a scoop at a time and my digestion is messed up. So oh, even more reason. Uh, pick a different protein also. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah mess with like okay. a Organifi. Okay. Something yeah. like that. That's going to be better on your Go gut. plant protein or collagen. Don't, don't, don't. If it's messing mm -hmm. your, your gut up, it's not worth it. Yeah. It's the way. Okay. All right. All right, buddy. Yeah, we'll, thank you guys. We'll send, right, we're going to send you All symmetry right, and performance. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, greatly appreciate it. You got it, man. Go kick yeah. ass. All right. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks, buddy. Bye. You know what the challenge is with somebody that age is, because uh, we always talk about this on the show, there's like what's optimal and then there's what you can tolerate. Yeah. The optimal for a kid is still here. Mm -hmm. But the difference between a kid and, in a, and somebody who's older is what they could tolerate yeah. is way over here. I mean, that doesn't mean that they'll get better results. Yeah. It's just when you're young, you could just tolerate so much. And so you just add more stuff. Resilient. Yeah. You just keep adding. Whereas if you're older... You get hurt, you, you get sick immediately, you feel it right away. Whereas when you're a kid, you just seem to like, don't get fried. Bulldoze through it, yeah. yeah. And you but, just keep repeating But patterns. it's not optimal. You're not going to progress that way. Well, that's what makes it so hard to measure when you're that age. Yep. You know, it's already hard because you're not experienced. You're young, you know what I'm saying? And then you have like this crazy amount of energy and that you could run off a low sleep. But you know, just because you can doesn't mean your body's going to respond. And he's, what, was he training five days a week with all that shit? Yeah. No yeah. Plus he's doing a power building. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I swear to God, if he hears this, if you literally just 30 days He's gonna commit, grow. commit yeah. to never missing your protein take for 30 days and you lift that the one day of symmetry, he'll grow. Yes. Yeah, he'll be more explosive out there in the field too. Yeah. Watch. Yeah. I did. I remember when I was uh, in my early 20s, I did a double split six or seven day a week routine and I didn't get sore. So I thought, oh, this is totally working. Of course, made zero progress yeah, I did the because thing. I could just tolerate so much thing. work. You do the same thing? Yeah, totally. Uh -huh. Yeah. All right. Next caller is Matt from Virginia. What's up, Matt? How can we help you? Hey guys, how's it going? Good, man. All right. Good. Thanks for taking my question. Thanks for uh, everything you guys do to teach and train. It's uh, been a lot of fun learning from you guys. Um, so I just, uh, I picked up the RGB bundle a couple months ago, really decided to do it. Um, my question is uh, I just finished uh, anabolic, had a great time with it, but I'm wondering if I made a massive mistake um, or wasted my time by pretty much running the whole thing on a caloric deficit. Uh, I, I lifted a lot when I was younger, but I'm just getting back into it now. Uh, I had a lot of fun doing the program, but my goal was in my head, it was just to lose weight. And I lost weight. I lost 14 pounds. Nine of it was fat. Five of it was muscle. I thought that was kind of just the name of the game. Uh, and I was really looking forward to move on to performance. It looked really, really cool, really fun. Um, but I'm wondering if I need to run the whole thing back with anabolic again on more of a, a, a bulk, more of a surplus. Anyway, so I want to get your advice on how to proceed. And then a second part of the question is kind of a mental thing of how do you guys deal with training frustration when you feel like you've been working and doing stuff and you're like, okay, uh, did I, did I just waste my time by doing the wrong thing for a while? Like, I've been doing my chest exercises all wrong, working my triceps rather than working my, my chest, which is something I learned from you guys as well. So those two things, how to proceed, how do you deal with frustration? Okay, so, mm. so generally speaking, all strength training-based programs are, are, are designed to build muscle, okay? Bottom line. Now, there's different ways to do it. There's different types of programming. There's different uh, types of strength that you may be focused on, whether it's like powerlifting or more bodybuilding style or more athletic type. Uh, training, but that's, that's what strength training does is it makes you stronger and builds muscle. Your diet is what determines whether or not you're trying to gain or you're trying to preserve while you burn body fat. So the reason why you strength train while you diet or get in a deficit is to try to keep the muscle sometimes build, but very rarely to keep the muscle while you get leaner. So did you waste your time? I mean, no. I mean, if, if your goal was to lose body fat, then, and then that's what's happened. Now, if you lost muscle during that period of time, then I would look more at the calorie deficit than anything else. It might've been too much of a deficit. You might've gone too hard 
in the deficit, or it could have been something else like, like sleep or stress, or maybe the volume was too much uh, or something like that. Now, second part about frustration, um, you know, it, 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 you, you mentioned something like, am I, I'm working my triceps more than my chest. Well, you just move forward. You just move forward. You're always going to learn as you continue to move along in terms of like what you focus on or what your goals are. And, you know, am I really moving forward? One of the best things you could do, and this is actually more uh, important, the more advanced you get is to change what you look at and what you're focusing on. You know, I can't, I've been working out for 30 years. I can't always focus on strength. It just, I'm not going to keep getting stronger forever. It's just not going to happen. So I don't look there uh, most of the time. Other times I'm looking at things like movement and uh, how I feel, maybe mobility, uh, maybe control, uh, stability, or just the enjoyment of the workout. Um, so where what you, in order to continue to do this for the rest of your life, you're just going to have to change where you look because you're not going to progress perpetually forever. Matt, let me ask you about your your cut. I want to know a little bit more detail so I could advise you on if I would have done it differently or I think you did just fine. Um, where were your calories at when you started the cut uh, and what'd you cut down to? Yeah, uh, so I started at 1,800 calories um, and then I moved down to, I think, uh, 1,550 is where I ended up going. And I didn't find your video on how long to do cuts until I was about done with it. <laughs> so a, I was like, okay. That, that's okay. I just wanted to know. Okay. So now let me explain what it would have been different, right? So we, we could have, and like Sal said at the beginning, you, your goal was to lose body fat and drop down. You did that and you did it at a higher ratio of fat than muscle. So overall, you didn't waste your time at all. But if we, if I had you as a client and I knew that you were only eating around 1800 to 2000 calories as a man, and I, and I know that you want to lose body fat, what I would have done first during anabolic would be to add calories and bulk you up. And so at the end of it, it might look more like this. You, instead of you actually losing 14 pounds, we actually might've only stayed the same or maybe even gained three pounds on the scale, which at first you might go, Oh fuck. Well, that's not my goal. I wanted to go down. You're a terrible coach and trainer. But if I did my job really well, I would have added a pound or two on the scale or kept you the same, but then you'd be eating like 25 to 2,700 calories. And now we'd be in this place where I could say, all right, Matt, you really want to lean out now? Let's drop that 27, 2,500 calories. Let's drop it down to 2,400 calories and go on to MAPS performance yeah. now and let's see what happens. And what would end up happening is you would lean out as much or more. You probably would hold on to a little bit more muscle because you're at a higher calorie supporting and, and higher protein and take the support the muscle you have on your body. And you'd be eating more calories and you'd get just as lean, if not leaner than what you currently did right now. So that that's the difference. Now, had you answered that question as, Adam, I was already eating 3,000 calories. I cut down to 2,500, and this is the results you got. Well, you already had a, pre a pretty good amount of calories. I wouldn't have probably pushed you up any more than that. So that would have been a fine decision. So we get asked this question all the time of, you know, well, should I run your program in a cut or a bulk? It really comes down to the client and where their current metabol metabolism is at on which direction I would shift. It has nothing to do with the program, like whether they're following anabolic or performance. It has everything to do with, if I'm getting you as a client, one, I want to know what your goal is, your ultimate goal is, and then I want to know where your current kind of state is, metabolism, where your where your your calorie maintenance is, and then together we decide is that is that a healthy amount of calories that you like to eat? Do you feel good on eating that, or would you like to be able to eat more? And so, based off of how you would answer me, would dictate on how I would steer you through the bulk or cut process running any programs that we right. have. Right, and just to clarify, Matt, like you could bulk or cut on any strength training program. Mm -hmm. It's the diet that determines that. How how tall are you and what's your body weight at? Yeah, I'm 5'10", and now I'm 181. Yeah, you're, you're, you, your calories were really low. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't have cut you at 1,800 calories. That's for sure you would have ended up with muscle loss. I mean, even if you, especially if you were hitting protein targets, you didn't leave much room for carbs and fats. What's cool, though, is that here's the thing, though, and this is why you didn't waste any time. Now that we go into performance, now I would run it in a bulk. Now let's mm -hmm. add calories. And then I would tell you to don't be worried if we if you if you put on a little bit of weight on the way, hopefully it's muscle. So you don't need to increase your calories dramatically. But our goal through performance should be can I get you up every week or two weeks? Can I increase you by a hundred to two hundred calories so that at the end of the program, I've got you now eating like twenty five hundred plus calories. And you haven't really put on any body fat. Maybe you put on a one or two pounds, but it's all muscle because we went on a bill on on a bulk and a nice slow bulk. And at the end of performance, I've got you 
more muscular without any more body fat and eating more calories. That would be the goal of performance with you now is to do that. That's what I'd, wa- I'd like to do with you. Yeah. Cool. Great. Yeah. Thanks. So do you, do you know how to do a reverse diet map? I do not. All right, I'll I'm going to send the you the video. I'm going to send you the reverse dieting guide because that's how awesome. you're going to that's how we should have you get into a bulk and get cool, yourself cool. up to like, you know, I would I wouldn't start thinking about really doing a cut till you get to at least 25 to 2700 calories. Okay. And and uh, and I know I didn't, I didn't touch on I know Sal touched on it but just a little bit to get like the frustration with yourself and so that man this is going to be this is a lifelong journey. I've been doing this for over 20 something years. I'm still learning lessons yeah. the hard way. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. So that's you, you, you look at it as as education, you know what I'm saying? And every time you follow a, a plan nutritionally and follow a program consistently, that's you putting in the work of educating yourself about your body, your nutrition, your exercise, like that so it's always worth it. Even if you come out of it and you fucked I don't can't tell you how many times I went into a cut or a plan and then you know, six, eight weeks later, I find out that I put myself in a worse shape from aesthetic position. I lost muscle and I mm. gained a and like you know, I mean that's so frustrating for a guy who's experienced, educated in this field, but it happens and that's part of the process. But I know now. I know that, oh wow, when I when I cut that aggressively and I push my body that much, I think because I'm doing all the work, I'm gonna get better results, but I actually got worse results. And you, so mm. it's a learning process. So, you know, chalk it up as part of the game of getting wiser on how to build a routine program and nutrition plan for yourself. Don't get discouraged or frustrated by it. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Really appreciate it. All right, man. man. Look, no matter what program you're following, if it's a strength training program, it's going to either build muscle or preserve muscle. Whether you cut or diet, that's, uh, that's up to the diet. It has nothing to do with uh, or bulk. Whether you bulk or cut, it's all about the diet. It has nothing to do with the program. All programs that we have are for building strength, building muscle, or preserving in a calorie deficit. So in a situation like that, how do you decide if you, like, let's say that this, like this person, Matt, is a client of yours, and you're getting ready to start a program, which you know could be a cut or a bulk, doesn't matter. What makes you decide, I want to bulk him or I want to cut him? Yeah, well, the, pe- mm-hmm. the goal, where their calories are currently at. Right. Like, like, he wanted to cut... That's the goal. Unfortunately, his calories were already so He's low, already low. Yeah. that I'm like, that's not a good idea. Mm-hmm. We go from eight, 1,800 calories for you a want guy. Some room. Yeah, like we're going to go down to 15. You're going to lose muscle. I don't care how great your strength training program right. is. You're going to lose muscle. Mm-hmm. So it's the goal and where your calories are at. And if you don't have enough, if you're not high enough in the calories, a cut doesn't make a lot of sense. In fact, somebody who wants to lose weight, but if their calories are already low, we actually bulk them. We actually mm-hmm. do what's called a reverse diet. So. Uh, both those things are the things that the factors that you want to consider. And then of course there's other stuff like how you feel and a lot of other stuff. As a general rule for me, I, I, almost everybody, regardless if you're trying to bulk or lean out, I almost look to introduce calories and increase their metabolism. Rarely ever have I ever received anybody who's like, Adam, I need to lose 30 or 40 pounds of body fat. And immediately I go into a cut because yeah. almost always they've kind of tried that on their own yo-yo yeah. diet and they've already kind of slowed yep. their metabolism down. So I almost the first all, nail they see is to just cut hard. Right. And that's t- typically what most people do. So when I, when I see their, their calorie maintenance, what they're currently eating to maintain their, yep. you know, 30 pounds overweight and I go, oh, wow, well, that's. That's not a place you want. If we got to cut, that means I got to cut you at least three to five hundred calories from there. And now we're in a place fifteen hundred calories for a male. That's so low. I don't, you're not going to sustain that for the rest of your life. I know that. You need to be somewhere closer to twenty five hundred calories or more a day to feel satisfied and to be able to do this forever. Right. All right. Next caller is Nick from Georgia. Nick, you're a real Rocky fan, aren't you? I noticed the shirt there. Oh man. Oh, love, it. Bro, love it, love it. That's all, all trying to score points with Sal. <laughs> Most people don't know that's uh, that's that's Mickey's gym right there, Mighty Mix, right there on his yeah. shirt, right? Gee, I wore this hoping you would you would know exactly what this is. Nobody ever gets it. They think I box, and I I'd get my butt kicked real quick. So <laughs> yeah, I see, real Rocky fans now. So cool. All right, so how can we help you, man? Yeah. So um, first, I just want to say thank you guys. Um, one for myself um, when I first started listening to you guys. Um, I was a real kind of meathead, thought I was really advanced, um, thought I was an advanced lifter and realized real quick, you guys kind of humbled me and showed me that I'm only, I'm only advanced in one area and not multiple forms of training. Um, and then I went through map symmetry and it really helped correct some, uh, chronic lower back pain I had that I had surgery from. Um, and then for my wife, um, she was a 
class lady. She was all about the cardio. And uh, I tried telling her every, I literally said verbatim, everything you guys said on the show, nothing clicked. And then I bought your book and I read it with her. And for some reason, when she heard it from Sal, she just, (laughs) man, she's been hooked ever since. So um, I have a few other things I want to get past her. If you could just write a book about it, (laughs) really appreciate it, man. Um, So she's hooked, but yeah. So um, just a little background. So 25 years old, I'll be 26. Um, later this month, I was a uh, former military, um, injured my back pretty bad, needed to get surgery, um, started doing a lot of physical therapy and that inspired me to go to college to become a physical therapist. And I'm currently in my undergrad part of that, which is rehabilitation sciences. Um, and I also, uh, became a certified personal trainer and nutrition coach. I've been training for about two years now. Um, and I just really have fa- fallen in love with it. Like, I just, I wish I was training people more, but realized that I can only put so much time and energy into school and training people. So right now I have about four clients in person. I'm not doing um, any online training right now, Uh, but yeah, I just really, I really, um, you know, I was, I was inspired before I met you guys, but you guys just kind of revitalized that vision for me um, and how to do it the right way with integrity. Um, and I kind of want to build something similar, but unique and authentic to, to my, to my vision. Um, I just don't know where to go, man. I just, uh, you know, I feel like, I feel like I can only do so much right now and I don't know how much to invest in my personal growth as a trainer. Cause I know I have a long way to go. Um, and also just the business side of it. So I just didn't know if you guys had any tips or what you would do if you were my age, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, just a real quick answer. NCI is going to be a great, I mean, for all the stuff you're looking for, uh, they're the best, uh, when it comes to teaching people how to build a business, especially, uh, we've, we've never run into anybody who's done as good of a job in terms of their system of teaching people how to build a business. You could always get a mentor, which I would say is the best thing you could do where you work with someone in person and you follow them around and you, you know, you, you work for them for free, just kind of learn how they build their business. But NCI's put it all together, and we've seen firsthand uh, them build, uh, help people build pretty successful businesses. So you're gonna like what we have coming down the pipe too. So we've got some cool stuff specifically for coaches and trainers that we're working on. We have been working on for uh, quite some time. Um, so, something more specific that I, if I'm if I'm you in the exact situation you're in, something I'm doing right now is trying to build a social presence. Right? So on Instagram or Twitter, whatever face, whatever platform you use. Um, I, I'm going to start to try and build a community there. Now, what does that look like? The mistake I think most people do is they look around uh, at other platforms or other famous uh, influencers and they try and model or mimic exactly what they're doing or they try and make a viral video. And it's like, that's not what I would do at all. Since you're already going through all the schooling and the education around physical therapy and you're mm-hmm. a certified personal trainer, you have this knowledge. Every day, the way the way I would steer my content is every day I learn something from school, that becomes a post. Mm-hmm. So you 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 learn to to work on something correct. Like you just learn on some you know, corrective work for you know knee issue, a specific one. And then you could make a post specifically to that piece of content. And that that's what would drive my content. Now your goal is to give this free, this all this great information you're paying for, you're working your ass off to learn into this like bite-sized Instagram versions of that for a community of people to share and enjoy themselves. And so, and this is only going to feed your potential future business, whether that's in physical Mm -hmm. therapy or as a personal trainer, or if you want to build a big brand like Mind Pump, start using that. You can also use all of our content. This is a mistake that coaches and trainers always make. They always like, oh, I want to build my own thing. And so they, they, they don't, utilize all the free shit that we have and there's this fear of oh my god if i share these mind pump guys all the time they're never going to want to buy coaching from me or they're not going to be in my business they're just going to go to their business that's such a scarcity mindset and small way to look at things look at it this way we've done all the work we spent all the fucking money building all these free assets out for you to utilize for your community so if you if you're drawing a blank on a piece of content that you want to Put up there that you think is valuable i'm sure there was something of ours that you listened to watched or read that was very valuable to you fucking rip it mm-hmm. rip it and use it share it with your community and start to build a community of people that now come to you for the, all this great information and that doesn't mean you cannot use 
our content to do that. So those are the two main things I would probably focus on if I'm you right now. I totally agree. I mean, I honestly, I think that because you're going through all the education right now, it's really just about like to, to internalize it, uh, to be able to teach it now, like as much as you can, it's really going to, um, you know, solidify that information that you're receiving right now as you're, as you're getting, I wish I would have done that more. Like I was just more kind of passive in receiving information and didn't really maximize my time, uh, in my educational process. Um, but also too, that just doubles up as content for you down the road. So whether it's you teaching yourself via video, uh, and then just cataloging that, or you have friends, family that you can kind of uh, apply these techniques or, or methods, or, you know, teach them something very specific, uh, that's going to help them nutritionally, whatever it is, um, just document it. And then, you know, and two, if you really want to do this and, and grow it something big, like you're going to need a lot of content these days to, to keep up. Yep. Are you working right now too? Are you working in a physical therapy office or in a gym? So I uh, had to get observation hours. I was working at a clinic for a while, um, but I'm just working at a gym right now as a trainer during the summer. Well, I, I have to study to get into the doctorate program and stuff. So it's, it's a lot. I'm not taking classes this summer, but I'm just working as a trainer right oh, now. Perfect. I was going to say, keep doing that as long as possible. And then if you could find, a, cause here's physical therapists are the best, uh, generally speaking, when it comes to correctional exercise, one thing they tend to lack is in training for hypertrophy, aesthetics, performance, um, unless that's their specialty. Um, so if you could find a physical therapist that you think does a damn good job, approach them and tell them what you want to do and, and literally say this, I will work for you for free. I just want to watch you and listen to you, uh, talk to your clients and your patients. And I want to watch you do things with them. And if you'll answer my questions, great. If not, no problem. I just want to follow you around. You'll learn more like that than you will in any textbook. So find somebody and see if you can follow them around. You know, I mean, 10 hours a week would be amazing and offer to do whatever they want for free. That'll be it's so much more valuable than, than what you're learning in class right now. The, the advice I gave about the, the posting too, uh, what are the beautiful side effects of that? I know, I know how intense the DPT school is. I mean, that's you. Got, it's like heavy, heavy studying for you. So it's only going to make you a better student. So I would even like my mindset when I'm doing it is like I'm not tripping out if I don't have ten thousand followers or but posts. Yeah. It's like I'm actually part of me doing it is actually to help, like Justin said, solidify that information. So I become a better student. So, so like it's selfishly motivated. Like I'm going to put this content out in hopes that I can reach people, teach the information that I'm learning. So I'm only going to get better at my craft. I'm only going to be a better student. And then along the way, what you're going to find out is you're kind of playing this game and throwing spaghetti on the wall and the most random shit sticks. You're going to post mm -hmm. something one day. This is if you, if you're consistent with the advice and you're going to be like, are you kidding me? This is what everybody wants yeah. to hear. Like that is the most basic. You're going to be like, oh Listen my God. to them too. Listen to the feedback. Yeah. It's and then, and, and then now you allow the feedback from the comments and the engagement and the sharing of, oh shit, maybe I'll go deeper on that subject. And now I'm going to make, instead of making just one post, I'm going to make 10, 15 different posts, teaching it in five, 10 different ways and showing the, the uh, progression of it, the regression of it, like other examples of it, the pitfalls, like, and oh, what I would eat when I'm going through that, like all the things you could think of could based off of the way people are giving you feedback. So that's mainly what I would focus on right now. And then take advantage of the NCI stuff, right? The NCI uh, they, they have a lot of free courses on there. There, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a $99 a month thing where you have access to the four of us every single Wednesday where you get to do a call and we talk all, you have open platform yeah. on Zoom with us to talk all business questions. So that's not a major commitment and it gives you an opportunity to, to probe us every single week. So just some ideas for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was like just probing. like, when I worked at the clinic, I just saw so many people who came in for surgery and it was like their third or fourth time there. And like a lot of the therapists, I'm not trying to cut anyone down. I hope no one I worked for is listening to me, but, uh, they were like the trainers themselves weren't the best in shape people either. Yeah. And I was just like, I was just like, man, you're a physical therapist. You're not in the best physical shape. And I also don't want to just be a physical therapist and heal these people's injuries. I want to have like my own personal training studio to show people, Hey man, there's there's something more than just rehabilitating an injury. If it if it rehabilitates the injury, it probably prevents it too. 
and like try to introduce them into a life of fitness and activity. So that's just kind of the dream. Um, I really appreciate it. So you, you cool. got it, man. And yeah. if, you, if, if do you have Prime and Prime Pro? If not, I'll send those to you because I think those will be valuable. I literally, I literally bought uh, Prime Pro because Justin looks like he could just like destroy me. So yeah. um, I just figured <laughs> I buy that. I bought that like last week. So I've like not. sixteen of your programs. All right, um, good deal, man. Sweet. Well, all right then, brother. Um, I got one thing for Adam though. Um, I was house sitting last week and went into the bathroom. They had these little uh, motion sensor night lights, and I have a really small bladder. I actually got tested um, for diabetes because I pee so much. Um, so I think you should go on Amazon and get one of these little motion sensing night lights because it doesn't wake you up. But so if you continue to sit to pee, it's just a choice at this point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. Thank you, Nick. Thanks, man. So yeah. embarrassing. Yeah, no you problem. keep us manly. Uh, so dude. embarrassing. <laughs> we need help. Right. Thanks. Thanks again, brother. <laughs> Take it easy, Nick. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate right. it, brother. Bye-bye. Thank you. You know, I, I, uh, I, I worked with a lot of physical therapists in my studio. So it sounds interesting that he wants to do that. And you, you see that like the physical therapists are really good at the correctional stuff, but a lot of them don't go beyond that. Yeah. So it's like, oh, movement's back, range of motion's back, but they don't know how to like really progressively overload, build strength, right. build muscle. There's no that solid direction. bridge there to kind of push them back into the gym to build muscle, to, to work on performance end of the, I, the The PT I worked with, she was so amazing at correctional exercise. And that's what I learned from her. And what she learned from me was the progressive overload stuff. And yeah. then we really, I mean, we just got really good uh, combining the two. So yeah, I was coaching uh, Melissa Wolf when she went through all this, her DPT school, and then she actually got hired onto a clinic. And I remember, and I was constantly probing and asking. I was just curious about the space currently at the time and everything like that. I had a buddy who was a physical therapist that we lived together, you know, a decade decade and a half ago and so want to know how it's evolved how it's changed and the thing that was the, like, the common thing that kept hearing from her is just like it's amazing how little of these uh, dpts know about uh, like training yep. strength training yep. wow. they're so focused on rehab That's so it. much that they're and they know that inside and out mm -hmm. but as soon as you step out of the yeah, rehab, how to do a deadlift an overhead press yeah yep. just completely uh, oblivious to all that so that was like one of the things that she was most excited to try and evolve and mm. change so it's good to see more, good. more pts yeah. like this there's a need there check it out if you want to follow some of our programs go to instagram mind pump media for under five dollars a month you get a free workout sent to you or set up every single week you can also find all of us on instagram so justin is at mind pump justin I'm at Mind Pump DeStefano, and Adam is at Mind Pump Adam.